but I'm, st- <laughs> I'm still high from Sunday. Uh, <laughs> now, I j- just quickly, what Tyler and I, before we, so we are live. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it was really cool but weird to see at the Emerald Cup all these people who I feel like were friends and I know well and like I know about their families and their lives and um, I've never actually physically met them in person and this weekend it was like oh my god so and so like we've never met in person like it was cool. Um, so just quickly uh, some housekeeping. Leighton is not with us this morning because um, his girlfriend, he, he's taking care of her uh, and it's basically end of life care. So everyone sends some love oh. to Leighton. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so they're um, spending time together, which is obviously bittersweet, but I'm happy they get to spend time together and uh, Anyway, he will be back uh, soon, and that's all I have to say about that. Uh, And with that, Brian, take it away. Yeah, good morning, Living Soil Nerds. It is kind of a a somber um, day today because uh, Leighton is tried and true to this. He hasn't missed a day, Uh, and obviously um, this takes it on a whole other level. So we just wanted as a family to kind of uh, hopefully reach out to him, DM him today, text him if you have his number. Uh, and just let uh, Leighton and Pauline know that uh, the community is thinking about them today uh, because obviously the family is also kind of giving up things. Peter's family, my family, Tyler's family, like everybody's kind of always um, putting up with when we're able to be on um, podcasts like this and take time. And really, you know, a three hour podcast is a, is a huge commitment in a day. And so just again, just to have uh, Leighton here each and every Thursday, I uh, just wanted to give him a shout out for the fact that he is missing today. And it's obviously for a huge reason. And uh, let's just uh, DM him again, text him, just let him know that uh, the community's uh, thinking about him. All right, uh, Tyler, you're, you know, the guest today. And I, I really feel like, man, you see the community on a probably a different level. Uh, you see when people are being successful and wanting to improve and like scale up. You probably have a lot of people coming to you from a variety of different grow methods that maybe want to uh, dip their toe in a living soil system. Maybe, you know, buy just a couple pots, put them in the corner, see how things start to rock. So I'm excited to pick your brain uh, today. And I know that you represent grassroots. I definitely want to get into that. But at the same time, man, I don't think you get enough of like, you know, let's dive deep into Tyler's brain as well. Uh, and then we can also talk about living soil pots and all that. But I feel like our community definitely deserves just to see, you know, you're kind of in the trenches, if you will. Like a lot of these guys are probably coming and tell a lot of uh, maybe some secrets that they normally wouldn't tell on some some successes and also some failures. You probably like I'm kind of getting at here. You're seeing both sides of, of the coin uh, probably more often than the than the average grower. Uh, so I'm sure you're picking and choosing from that, you know kind of cooking your recipes, learning, learning things. One of the things I learned about you, uh, you know, kind of early on was the fact that you still really enjoy going out of your way to use like PPM meters, EC meters, uh, pH is still uh, highly important to you. So I wanted to kind of run down that road as well. Uh, but I wanted to start off with your, your family. I thought that something was pretty interesting uh, with my research uh, for you on this week. Uh, is that your family was kind of a a close-knit thing. That's something that's very important to me. And it seemed like, you know, you talked about your father, your family were raising dogs, Jack, uh, Jack Russell's, I believe. Uh, And then you're, you know, you're hustling as a family. And then from what I understand, you had to get out of uh, an environment that you're at. I can relate to that uh, growing up, growing up decently poor. I feel like there's just certain things that you have to face on a day-to-day basis. And if you can get yourself out of that, why the hell wouldn't you do that? Um, so then I understood that your father kind of secretly wanted to grow cannabis and kind of improve the family as a whole. So I wanted to start there, man, because I feel like that is for our little community. That is the American dream, man. If we have a skill set and we can take care of our family, we can find ways to improve that family so that, you know, at least your children are off uh, maybe being educated a little better than than you were. And you could continue to pass that torch. I do feel like that a lot of that comes from your environment. Uh, ways that you can be misled, uh, especially with some of the bullshit that can happen in like bigger cities sometimes. Uh, so I just wanted to start there, man. Let's kind of talk about your background because I found it unique. And then we can obviously get into all the nitty gritty. But uh, let's let's pick Tyler's brain for a little bit. Well, thank you, guys. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. 
you Peter. Does that glitch out? Were you got you guys having technical difficulties? I just came back. Up, oh, there's Tyler. Tyler, can you hear us? Yeah, I'm still there. Hello. There we go. Can you yeah, hear we us? Yeah, can. There we go. Can you hear us? You guys, can you hear me? <laughs> we had problems yes, with this yesterday, I think. Uh, try closing out, Tyler, and coming back. Hold hey, guys. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. Let me let me type. You can hear me, Brian, right? Yeah. I can hear everyone. I can hear everyone. Um, Hold. <laughs> I, I I'm queuing up the messages. Uh, switch your uh, speaker source. Uh, all right, that's uh, there. We go. That will be ready for him when he comes back. Hold on, and we can even make it. Here he comes. Here he comes. Really sorry about that, guys. Can you hear us now? I can hear you guys great. Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. All right. Yeah, great. <laughs> Just sorry when I got that. high in the morning, you guys made me I do got... fucking technical support. No, I, was, uh, I got a phone call in, and one phone call there uh, derailed me, so I'm sorry about that, guys. No, it's um, funny. But... I, I have uh, all my babies outside. They're, like, in the yard. And there's a certain spot where the sun hits in the early morning, so I put them there, and then I, have to, I just ran out to move them. And they're filming a TV commercial outside for the... Uh, and the, the guy was like, I'm not supposed to tell you this. <laughs> so I'm going to tell everyone. Uh, it's the, the uh, electric Hummer. So, like, Ooh. LeBron James, I think he said LeBron James is in the commercial, but they're filming outside. It, it's just a scene where a guy runs around a corner... Uh, I think that's literally the only scene they're shooting outside, and uh, it's like a 50-person film crew for <laughs> for one scene where it's he's not even like it's a talking scene. It's just like a visual scene. So anyway, that's uh, yeah, that's just like uh, when I was in Peru, I was at Machu Picchu visiting the most epic place I've ever seen in my in my life, and they were filming uh, some scenes for the new Transformers movie at Machu Picchu. And I was totally blown away, and I kind of sat there looking at it for a while, and there was about 100 people and about 50 security guards. And uh, it ended up being four guys with poles, and they had tennis balls on the end of the poles, and there was kind of like marking where like the shoulders and head of a Transformer would be, and there was one giant camera. But it's just amazing the setup they have just for one shot. So, Tyler, since we're getting into you, the human being, let's uh... – Let's get to know. Let's get to know the personal <laughs> side of Tyler. So this is Machu Picchu with the girlfriend, correct? Yeah, yeah. Who I, who I met girl. up in uh, at uh, Emerald Cup. Yeah, she and, came and with I was the like, Emerald I know Cup. you from the Instagram posts. <laughs> she was like, Oh, oh my gosh! Uh, but yeah, that's my beautiful girlfriend, Jocelyn. Uh, I got to meet her here in Sacramento, and uh, we hit it off. And she invited me back to Peru. Went out to Peru and uh, spent two weeks with her, and um, life changing, honestly. Just the so most she she's cool. Peruvian. Yeah, she's from uh, Lima, Peru, um, and her secondary language is American, and she also does speak a little bit of Portuguese. Uh, she's a very smart girl. She's actually a fishing engineer. She works for the government of Peru, and they help sell. She helps sell the exported uh, seafood that the fishermen of Peru uh, collect and sell. Uh, this right here is really what you guys need to see. This is a, a couple thousand year old irrigation system. So they piped uh, pretty much, you know, found an aquifer in the side of the hill and then channeled it to their growing site. So this is still an irrigation system that's working from that, uh, pretty much a thousand years ago. And it travels for about 100, 150 yards uh, down to their terraces, which is so epic to watch that. And to follow that. That's cool. It's like the Roman aqueducts, right? Like engineering yeah, yeah. marvels. Yep. And, you know, uh, Machu Picchu was just opening back up because of uh, the pandemic and stuff like that. And there was hardly, you know, anybody there. 
And the whole trip, honestly, I mean, cost me a couple thousand dollars American. Uh, traveling to Peru is very inexpensive. Um, $100 American is worth $400 out there. And they have some of the best food, the best service, um, security guards everywhere in the streets, police officers everywhere. I felt super safe. Um, you know, traveled out there with my Puffco, enjoyed it. Um, epic trip, man. Epic trip, you know. Um, so, yeah. They, I mean, those rocks are so perfectly formed. There's not even air passing through there. Um, and if you go there, you have to try the alpaca. Like, if you like beef, there's lamb, and then there's alpaca. Oh, the grass Dude, that, ma that makes me so yeah. sad, though. I, I love alpaca, but for their oh, their, I love I their love cute Dr. Seuss man. lovableness. Oh. You, that that's like that's oh. like a children's nightmare book that you would write uh, of the slaughter <laughs> of the. It's like the beginning of the Dr. Seuss book is like happy alpaca doing happy, cool, fun things. And then the yeah, end right. of it is like yeah. Tyler coming in with a fucking butcher knife and slaughtering them. And uh, I think for the children babies. and for all the people, you know, if you start it the other way around where they visit it first on the dinner table and they respect it from, you know, like what it is as a food and what it is brought to them as a meal. And then they trace it back to where it goes as an animal. I think they'll have a lot of, a lot of respect for it. Definitely. You got that whole meal for $35? Yeah, and that was at the end, that was coca tea. So that was tea made from coca leaf. Um, and it's amazing what that does to your digestion system. You can have a giant meal. You can eat the biggest meal of your life and go back and drink some coca tea. And 20 or 30 minutes later, you're hungry again um, and you feel revitalized. Um, you don't feel, you know, obviously uh, intoxicated by any means. It's just very, very relaxing. Yeah. Yeah, I but, wanted uh, someone to bring me back. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. Sorry. By the way, Brian, <laughs> one of the reasons I generally don't get high during shows is because I get super chatty. And then <laughs> well, that's great to, for today, man. Let's all yeah. chat it up. <laughs> like I said, Tyler, we want to pick your pick your brain a little bit, but I, your background is, is interesting to me because I feel like as a family man, uh, what your dad did is is exactly what I feel like a lot of people were doing at that time. Taking calculated risk is the way I like to view it. You know, kind of like moving the family in a certain place. What I wanted to get in deeper to is like, how, how was he able to kind of guide you guys and showing like, OK, this is this is illegal at this point. But we as a family are doing this. Or did you have no idea when you were a child? Uh, you know, I mean, it was kind of the glory days of 215. You know, there's actually a, a photo actually way before 215 times of uh, my dad growing a plant in an old 30 gallon trash can on the back porch. And uh, I remember my dad specifically having to move that plant from house to house and not wanting to give it up and the uh, trial or, you know, getting that thing into a, a U-Haul, you know, <laughs> a long time or whatever he did. I barely remember because I was so young, but, you know, epic stuff way back in the day. But, um, you know, when we moved up to the mountains from the Bay Area, um, you, I didn't really realize, but that was, you know, kind of, he put us into like the golden zone of, you know, some of those 215 areas where you'd put yourself into, um, you know, the wilderness in a certain sense with nobody around you and allow that plant just to grow naturally. And, and, you know, we'd be out there, you know, doing, doing our watering and doing our feedings and stuff like that. And, you know, now that I think back to it, we were more organic back in the day. And then all these brands came in and then we started going on to like me coming into the farm when, you know, 10, 15 years ago and saying, dad, you know, what about this? Or what about that product I saw in the hydro store and him being like, well, we were fine without it, you know, but okay, let's, let's, let's go into this and let's try it, you know? And I remember being, you know, before that whole shift came along, but getting to the legal side of it and everything like that, you know, it was kind of just like presented to us as just like, you're here out in the middle of nowhere and, you're policing yourself and you are to be a steward of the land. And uh, we always felt that what we were doing was well within those uh, means. So that's kind of the thought process behind that, what we were doing and how we were doing that. Um, all the way today to being on that same property and expanding it out and uh, going out there and working as much as we do and, and going through the stuff that we do. It's just, uh, it's amazing. It's a lot of fun uh, tearing up because it's a, uh, it's a lot of fun over the years of what we do and going through it is, is just, uh, uh, very thankful, very thankful to have it and have my family. So 
Yeah, it's something uh, yeah. that, um, you know, it is something that I feel like hopefully more and more people are getting back into and then we'll pass on from generation to generation is the knowledge, at least, you know, hopefully your children guide, you know, following your footsteps in some ways. But I feel like if we can get more people just involved in understanding where their food come from. Um, and I know like from my my child's uh, preschool, kindergarten kind of stuff uh, before COVID and that kind of thing, they started to actually talk about healthy foods and um, I, I feel like that wasn't taught to us in Georgia. Uh, we didn't, yeah, we, we didn't really yeah, like discuss how- health or that chicken from, you know, a, a, a fast food place is the same thing. To be honest with you, I felt like I, I believed that till I was in high school. That like chicken is the same. So if it's 99 cents, you know, um, and the overall health of, of your family, I think really dictates to how much extra spending you have. So I'm, I'm kind of tying that back into, I admire the fact that, a family is going to take risks together like that. I feel like that's something that not every family is willing to do. And they just kind of are on this grind. And it seems like you guys took calculated risk, uh, was able to move your family to a better location. Uh, and then hopefully for you, it, it was more of like a rocket ship, you know, just within a few years, if everybody's kind of putting in their work, a uh, family can really kind of transform itself into something positive as a unit. Yeah, definitely. Uh, my brother-in-law was probably one of the biggest proponents of that uh, Sierra family grown on Instagram. Uh, he had just went through a major back surgery actually this last year and has been completely laid up. Uh, but go uh, show some love to Sierra family grown on Instagram. That's kind of our, again, our kind of family account there that that uh, he manages and goes through there. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there we go. Sierra family grown uh, just went through uh uh, major back surgery there, but, uh, Mike, my brother-in-law is a big proponent of that. Definitely. Uh, getting out there and, uh, in this picture, and, which one is he? Uh, he's, uh, the one right there with, uh, doing the shocker. Okay. On the right. Yep. On the right. Sorry. I'm a little yeah. slow on draw today. I like seeing so you. Well, I was, Peter. <laughs> this, so also the, the other uh, thing that factored into this is the wife is uh, no longer in town for the next week. So uh, I get to smoke weed in the house and do whatever I want and not get nagged for it. But I think that's cool. So do, does your dad approve? So he must be totally psyched with what you're doing. Yeah, definitely. You know, honestly, I was working. He's a at proud a, papa. 18, he's a proud papa. I was uh you know, definitely uh, an unhappy employee working for the AT and T cell phone company. And, and uh, my phone <laughs> I was company. about to say, you, my it's like the inverse of like the prototypical family, where it's like we we hope our son aspires to be an accountant or a lawyer or a business person. Yeah, and you, know, you guys are the opposite, yeah. where like you're heading down the business path, and your dad's like, I hope he sees the light. I was always a hustler, man. Uh, my, I started with my cousin when I was 13 years old. We used to sell uh, newspaper subscriptions in front of grocery stores and go door to door. So he had a company where we worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, the Sacramento Bee, uh, a lot of little newspapers. And we sit out in front of grocery stores in the Bay Area and we'd hand out free newspapers. And I'd pitch them like, hey, it's $20 for a whole year. You know, uh, breaks it down to 25 cents a day. You need this at your doorstep. You know, your wife can bring it to you with your coffee. It's going to be a great day. You know, I'm going to help you do that. And uh, gosh, I still remember some of those sales pitches. That was like 20 years ago. Um, but that's where I started, man. We were hustling. That was 100% commission where like you would go out and you'd make no money or you'd go out and sometimes I'd make you know, a couple hundred bucks. Um, I did that until I was about 18 years old and I got to the point where I even had my own uh, business name, Plat Marketing. Um, and I had a crew of about six that or seven That was a very guys. creative had, marketing yeah. name you came up with, by the uh, way. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, it was just for tax purposes at that point because I was making money and um, I was doing really good. I was I was honestly hustling in the, the legitimate market as a young kid. And to the point where before I graduated high school, I had bought myself a brand new 2007 GMC Sierra. Um, and uh, the funny thing is, is shit changes. Shit changes real fast. So that was in 2007. Well, if anybody remembers 2007, 2008 is shit got bad in 2008. So uh, um, the economy crashed. Uh, we lost everything. Uh, the, you know, my job was gone in a certain sense because who wants to buy a newspaper, you know, and everything was converting to online. So um, in, the, in the end, the truck got repoed and I restarted and I went back and I worked for um, a tire shop 
for a couple of years, grinded, learned about cars. Like that was a major thing about learning about mechanics and cars and just like going through the, the processes of like uh, how to get there in life. So went from there and I, I was working at a tire shop and looked across the street and I saw these guys, you know, driving up in nice cars, working at the cell phone store. And I was like, man, that guy's driving a rolling a lot nicer car than me. He's coming up at, you know, rolling in late, late to work at 10 o'clock in the morning. Looks a little hungover. Like, man, he's, he's having a little really good time. You know, looks like he's got money in his pocket. So, you know, I started harassing those ladies over there and ended up getting a job at at and And I worked there for six years. Uh, hated that job. Honestly, I did it for just for the money. It, uh, it's it like the best the, money I it, could find in that small it, town. It's like the crew on the uh, commercial. So it was really cold this morning, and uh, they're all they've probably been there since it was dark at like five a.m. setting up. And I walk outside with my like hot, fresh cup of coffee and like my sweatpants, totally comfortable. I have a little like beach chair that I put in the in the lawn, and I have all my plants, and I'm like doing my morning smoke <laughs> and they're all miserable. And I'm like, I'm hard at work right now. Like this is work. <laughs> I remember getting in trouble at at and uh, from the IT guys because they were like, what's Mendo dope? Like, why are we seeing this on the YouTube thing? Like what's going on? And I like channeled, I like triggered all of these other things for IT. So now they locked us out of like so much crap because I was watching Mendo Dope grow 10 pound plants on YouTube and stuff like that at the at and store. So, um, you know, it ended up to where I uh, walked into grassroots in 2015 to buy some fabric pots. And, you know, my loud mouth in the office talking, the boss came out, Rich, and uh, we started talking and communicating. And uh, by the way, can, you, can later, you make a working. cameo today? Uh, yeah, he was just in here. Um, I've got the phone on a little mobile thing here, so I'm ready to kind of jump around. Um, in the next 45 minutes is probably going to be the main part of our manufacturing. So it'd be a good time to go out and show you what we're doing today and what we're manufacturing to uh, build up for the season. I know we're cutting some 20 gallon living soil pots right now. Um, so yeah, I could bust into Rich's office and say, hi, he's probably one of the, the coolest older dudes that owns a business you'll ever meet. Do you, do you do you ever have to tag into the production line and start like cutting fabric and stitching it together? Oh, they will run me out of the floor. They don't want <laughs> they'll run me. No, I mean I, I'm I'm really good. I'm a very handy person, but uh, my job here is sales. Um, I will get in there. I, if, if there's a major thing going on, we'll have a folding party or we'll have a party to build a pallet. So anytime I'm uh, they need my help is you know is when we're getting the product out the door, getting one to the customer, or if I've got to hop in the truck with one of our people and get out to a farm and get something delivered. Um, you know, the year before last, I think we delivered uh, over 290 foot raised beds to the local community here in between Nevada City and Grass Valley, um, all over um, in between a few customers. So um, we're going all over the place. Um, it's been a little crazy because of the pandemic, but um, it's been fun. So I know we're bouncing all around here, Brian. Sorry to, might have to get us back on track here. That's okay. I mean, I, like I said, it's it's rare to see Peter like this, so we can ride with this, you know, check out stuff. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we have three hours together, so I can definitely pick your brain. And one other thing, uh, right before you go talk to Rich, is I I heard that you've been smoking weed since you were eleven. I thought that was pretty interesting, man, because it seems pretty young. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have an older sister, um, and uh, I remember you know, some of her friends that were hanging around or something like that. And I saw them uh, later on in the park when I was out with another buddy. And um, it was kind of my first time uh, them saying, oh, you're so-and-so's little brother. You must, oh, you must be cool. And I'm just like, oh yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Like, you know, and then you had, you, you had like your, did you have Changed braces? <laughs> what was that? I said, did you have braces or like a retainer in or something? No, no, nothing like that. But I was young and, and very, very immature looking. But uh, these guys introduced me to cannabis for the first time. And um, I didn't know, but I had, you know, I just ADHD. I just couldn't hang on, couldn't anything. So, you know, that was the first time I touched cannabis. I don't think I really got a hold of it and really started consistently smoking cannabis until I was in high school, honestly. Um, you know, here and there with my buddies, you know, we'd score an eighth or something like that and be smoking. But I consistently definitely have been smoking flower cannabis since I was in, you know, freshman because I was, you know, I had a job. I was always working. I had my own money. And it was clear to me if you if you wanted something more than you're giving, you got to go out and get it. So I went out and got it. And uh, 
enjoyed it. Yeah, your father's teaching you the entrepreneur spirit, you know, what are, whatever it takes to be able to put the, the family first. Yeah, that and my whole family, you know, we're all, uh, they were all hardworking people from my uncle who did hardwood flooring back in the day to my cousin who started, started his businesses and uh, did selling newspaper subscriptions and made thousands of and thousands of dollars selling newspapers like it's it's crazy you know and all kinds of other stuff i i got to see and witness and then um you know uh just finding my love for cannabis is one thing that was probably the one like always thing i could go back to that was like the one thing that made me really happy always made me happy was watching a plant grow and watching that kind of happen and and i think really what came down to that is is you know my parents, they moved up to the mountains and my dad would grow vegetables, you know, and that vegetables were right in front of us or right in the backyard. And the cannabis was like more like cut and hidden away from the family. And it was always like, man, oh my gosh, I'm so happy we moved up here because the, the soil is so much better. And these tomatoes, like, I just can't believe how much better they taste. I can't believe like how they're just so full of minerals and we feel so much better eating these things. And I remember, you know, um, big old slices of tomato on our dinner plates with mayonnaise and salt. And it was just like, it was so good. It became just a piece of the meal, you know, it actually became like a side, which is, um, has to be something that's really tasty, you know, as a vegetable to actually do that, just raw cut off the plant and put onto a plate and to be that good. So, you know, I was always the one to be like, well, why, why is that? What's, what's going on? What's the difference here? Why is it in the Bay area? We didn't like this stuff. You know, why is it why that we're here in the mountains next to these trees and next to these mushrooms and actually all these really beautiful, great smelling things. You'd walk out there in the forest and just be mesmerized by the smell and how clean it was. And um, my dad always said it was the soil. It's always, it's a soil sign. I'm like, you know, that's what's going on. So that kind of started it. And, you know, there's so many years of just, uh, confusion you know and all these moments of clarity and confusion clarity and confusion i think everybody goes through that when you're living learning living soil of just like you're learning to trust the soil and you're learning to trust you know your soil testing and what you're done to it and as you're stewarding it you know and obviously those good results come along and you want to quantify why did i have these good results in these areas why why didn't i have these good results in these areas so i think that's what i've been chasing the most is is that data and that science, um, you know, there's the people that have dived a lot deep into the microbiology side of it and take uh, Elaine Ingham, uh, their course, and they go very deep into that side of it. And there's people that go really deep into the soil testing side of it. And I just, I, I want to focus and gain as much knowledge from all those different places as possible uh, with a large factor of being, you know, my successful customers with grassroots and what they're doing and how they're doing it is is, you know, they're about data, they're about numbers, um, you know, and, and like you said, Brian, is is we see, you know, when a company calls us and says, you know, I had this one grower doing this and he ordered all these fabric raised beds from you guys and, and you know, I didn't even know where we're going this path and he's not with us anymore, but we're still want to kind of use these things. What's What do we do and how do we use these? You know, and I've got to go in there and break it down for them and show them, hey, I got all these other successful customers that are going in there and having a really high quality soil and they're soil testing. They're doing saturated paste testing. They're doing tissue testing. They're doing sap testing. We're we're looking at the pH. We're looking at the EC. We're, we're you know, inoculating with beneficial fungi. We're doing all these different things, um, you know, and um, I definitely see what's working and what's what's not working, whether it's the, the grower, which is a rarity. It's usually the, the grower not meshing correctly with the, the corporate life and corporate world of what they're they're expecting and what they're doing compared to a person who's, you know, ran their own life and done their own thing. Um, you know, and some some growers, you know, just thrive in that area and thrive with that pressure. So, um, you know, there's some some people that I've been mentored by in the industry that thrive under that pressure and thrive in those situations and are constantly surviving. Um, there's also the people that thrive and survive in the gray market in that gray area. You know, I, I have a lot of people that are mentors of mine that that don't want people places to be legal. They want it to be a black market or they want it to be that emerging market where it's a black market going into a white market and they thrive in that gray area where those those rules aren't there, but they're being built and there's a lot of freedom there. So, you know, me personally, I, I'd retract it back to 215 and keep things how they were because, you know, I got to put my, I, I could still do it now, but I, I 
was so motivated. I put my stuff into the Emerald Cup. I put rosin into the Emerald Cup into in 2017 and uh, was in the top 40 um, and uh, was even told I was being considered, you know, for closer than that. So we were freaking out and all that stuff. It was amazing just for flower rosin back in 2017. So, um, you know, that's still a dream and a passion of mine is to be chasing those things down. Um, you know, using the same soil now for four seasons, um, definitely seen some major stuff. So uh, I'm just going in all these wild directions, Brian. So, you know, let me know if you want to zone in on, on something specifically here. Well, um, I, I, I can, it's kind of the point of this, uh, the way that we do this with the three hour, it's very candid so that you can kind of just sit here and we get to pick your brain instead of it being more of like snippets. Uh, and that's what I really like about it is allowing you to kind of like go through that process of uh, explaining a lot of what you do. And it seems like because of the process, the way that you've carried yourself over the years, a lot of the big names are using uh, your your fabric pots. Uh, the biggest one I feel like and the one that I admire the most uh, would be Steve Cantwell in, in Las Vegas. Um, you know, he's he's got everything dialed in, uh, in my opinion, for the style that he's doing. Uh, and yet he's still choosing to use your your um, your pot. So I feel like there's something to be said on that. You know, when somebody is going out of their way to really be known nationwide now because of their location, people, tourists flying yeah. in, finding out about you and then flying back. Uh, that's yeah, definitely he's something. constantly, constantly innovating. You know, he's the one who's doing these these sleeves now. So this is a, a, a one gallon sleeve with no bottom. And yeah, I wanted to kind of jump into that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, Let's talk about uh, a little bit of what he discovered. I feel like the viewers probably do know a little bit about that, but uh, he, he's basically continuing to just ev evolve this entire uh, movement. Yeah, he really is. He's going further. and It comes down to a small producer trying to, um, you know, be very, uh, I would say, labor um conscious you know what does it take to get this done you know when he's a he's an owner him and his wife they they own the grow they own their system and they're moving forward in that path forward of, of always staying in that way uh green life productions and obviously if you can lower your labor costs and set the sleeve on top of the soil um you know that eliminates a lot not having to transplant into the soil and eliminates transplant shock too so that's a major thing if you can eliminate transplant shock that's 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 pretty major. So, you know, they're taking a little saucer. They're putting every single one of these sleeves in a small saucer. They're filling it with soil and then they're in their clone to this uh, two to three, maybe you know, so it's not you know super productive. Maybe four weeks later, uh, the roots are filled out in the bottom and you can take that off of the saucer and set it on top of the soil. Um, obviously, Steve does a much better job explaining this. And I think even on his Instagram, he has a 14 minute video where he goes from you know, filling these things all the way through the point where he removes it. Uh, he's actually going to end up uh, keeping the soil in these and start reusing these with the same soil in them as well. Um, and he explains that in the video. So I really suggest getting that information from him directly uh, here at Grassroots. We always try to um, let everybody know it's not us doing this kind of stuff. We're just the manufacturers speaking for the community in a certain sense. You know, we still are the only manufacturer of fabric pots and raised beds um, that does a $500 minimum order on custom. Uh, there's certain times of the year where we've even done, you know, a lot less than that to make custom products for people. And, and really custom is why we are who we are for the industry. And, and that's been my big proponent with grassroots is being the fact of saying, we've always got to do custom. We've always got to be able to help these small growers because this is where it's starting. There's so many people like say it's, it's latent. There's so many people, you know, obviously like Brian or other people, that have all these amazing ideas that um, that just prove that we're in infancy, the infancy side of, of living soil and, and knowing where this goes for the future. So um, that it, that's one of the, the main thing that excites me about my job is I get to take phone calls from people like Steve Cantwell that are trying to innovate and trying to improve. And he's so excited. He was so pumped about this, you know, and, and it was so I was able to get him samples in like less than a week. And he was trialing this in one bed, you know, within two or three weeks and proof of concepts were there. And then, you know, he fired one of 3000 units. So, um, you know, it's, it's, and now we have, now we have these on our website. So if you go to our classic fabric pots on grassrootsfabricpots.com, you can buy these sleeves for $2 and 50 cents a piece. 
and I will be really mad if you throw these things away. You better reuse them. You better wash them with baking soda and vinegar. If you throw anything from grassroots away, um, you know, you're I, just burning I, money. I've seen angry Tyler. Don't make Tyler angry. <laughs> so j just quickly, can you explain to people exactly what's going on? So the idea is that you have your, your clones, which grow out roots in the bottomless pot, right? And you can just put it right in position. And you never have to basically lift it. You never have to transplant them into their final home, right? Because the roots just grow right yep. down. They're You're not digging into, into the, the soil. System. Right. So this is taking, you know, no-till further, way further, because before it would no-till, you were still digging your hole, you know, displacing soil, putting your transplant in there, you know, and, and people a lot of times were taking that a lot further. You know, they were banding with, you know, amendments. They were doing all this other stuff. You know, they were digging further than they need to. You were, you know, hurting your fungi, your bacteria. You're taking the bacteria that's made to be down here and moving it back up here, making things harder to happen. So I think this just makes things, you know, more no-till in a certain sense. Um, you know, in his 14-minute video, he really, it's cool how he breaks down how that thing, after the plant is, you know, harvested, just like we've seen anything else, that stem, that little, little thing that's sticking up, uh, just wants to fall apart and come away after a little while. Yep, and there it is right there. Um, so, and he just uh, is always moving back to that original spot. You know, you, you plant here, then you plant right next to it as close as you can, and you're just moving right back in between those two spots. Um, so I believe in, he's in his 27th cycle of the same soil. Um, I've talked to Steve personally about this, and in that room, he really wants to get to 100 uses of that soil is his goal. Uh, before he makes any changes as far as the beds go, um, as far as, um, you know, any of the layout or anything else, you know, the only major changes he's done is upgrade his lighting. Uh, that was a major improvement for the yields uh, in the facility. Um, you know, there's a lot on social media about, you know, what Steve has done with, with LED lights in that facility. But obviously, you go from really old LED lights to really new LED lights, you know, there's a major improvement just, just there, let alone going with, you know, one of the best companies that are out there. Um, so don't, don't, are, don't ask Nelson though. Yeah. Don't ask Nelson. I'm not going to get into that whole light thing. I, I personally believe you should be growing your plants outside in the sun like Peter's doing. You know, I think the sun is the best possible thing you could ever be using. And, um, sure. you know, I'm major. Most of my customers are harnessing the sun in some way in a greenhouse or outdoors or, or doing something. And there's a lot of customers that are doing indoor stuff. And I, I think that's that's awesome because it's the most sustainable way you could be doing indoor. You know, people like Steve are going to reuse their soil a hundred times. You know, yeah, that's Peter, just can his... you pull that back that video back up? Because as you do that, I want I want the uh, community to know that Steve and then two other assistants. That's all that manages that facility day in and day yeah. out. It's so There's dialed. There's three in. or four rooms like that. You're just seeing one of the rooms. And, and the rooms are gorgeous from head to toe. I mean, it is praying leaves as far as the eye can see, green as far as the eye can see, and veg, uh, beautiful flowers, obviously finishing out in, um, in late flower. Uh, and it just is a continual process. So, yes, if we could all grow outdoors, I know that we would love to do that on a ranch with alpacas like you had mentioned. That was my dream, uh, having like Clydesdale <laughs> horses running around. Before they head to the slaughterhouse. I've never, I've never thought about eating them. I liked them as a... Uh, I've always heard they're more like uh, like they have dog personalities. They so when I was when I was 22, I wrote a whole business plan to go down to uh, southern Chile and and start an alpaca ranch and uh, Winaco and Vicuña. And uh, I had this guy who was in Colombia, who's like the foremost veterinarian expert on alpaca, who is on board the biggest U.S. rancher of alpaca on board. Uh, and then I started this software company and got totally distracted, but that was like, that's still my goal in life is to hang out with alpaca all day. Amen to that, man. There is just something about that animal, especially if you love farming. I mean, it's, it's like a close, talk about a closed loop system. Uh, so anyway, we're getting, we're getting sidetracked by that, but like, I feel like from an indoor side of things, um, indoor farming if this if that's the way that you're going to have to to farm to you know protect your brand protect your investments and like you said this is a family-owned farm so they can't really risk uh being in the city in las vegas you know it's they're on the outskirts and i feel like it's they just have their own little beautiful plot of land that they're continuing to improve 
Uh, and that's really, I feel like the dream as a cannabis farmer is just to take this, like you had mentioned to, if you can, to the, the open commercial market, but still hold those values of kind of the black market days. Yeah. And Steve is uh, really working hard to get a large greenhouse outdoor there. Um, so he's, you know, working to be even more sustainable and, you know, be being a larger producer in his state and um, his flower rosin, uh, excuse me, his, uh, hash rosin is becoming very popular I imagine so um in that area um so you know uh working with those great people and, and honestly every single one of those people is kind of like a mentor i've you know gotten to certain times where i've gotten to sit down with them and hang out with them or be there at their groves and learn from them and stuff like that it's just i have uh, selfishly been taking that and using that in my own grow in my own situation and uh trying to take those little things and use them in any way possible. Um, you know, whether it's been working with uh, Scott Compressive Soil Services, uh, I've gotten, you know, to, to work with uh, Groru, um, Aaron, uh, toured facilities with him and work with customers, you know, doing that. Um, uh, Nick Tomasini, uh, Humankind Oregon, um, you know, I've gotten to work with him a little bit. I've gotten to work with some just amazing people in this industry. Um, so it's it's kind of cool to have this toolbox of people when somebody calls me and calls into grassroots and says, you know, hey, I'm in Michigan. I'm doing this big greenhouse. We want to do rolling benches. We want to do living soil raised beds. You know, we want to do those cool new liners that you guys are doing uh, for next gen greenhouse. And um, we've got about three of those projects happening on the East Coast this year. Um, so it, it's really great, you know, a few years ago, grassroots press question ourselves, how do we fit into the commercial space? Um, are we going to be in the commercial space and the commercial industry and be a desired product? And, and now it's amazing that people like Steve Cantwell are bringing us into other parts of the industry. We never thought we'd ever be a part of, uh, with these raised beds and sleeves. And, and now it's like, we're in veg and we're in, we're in the whole, we're in almost every part of this now. And it's just amazing. So, uh, we're, we're going along for the ride and doing everything we can to produce uh, really fun stuff for the industry. Um, and now we're finally going to come out with some great marketing and great swag and cool t-shirts and great stuff to support the community and, and show you guys how much we, we love living soil and how much we want to help you guys help us educate the community as well. Peter, I wish you would have fired the trigger on that alpaca farm. Just dude, I, I, I no, I'm still gonna make it happen. <laughs> My stick to itiveness lasts decades. It's the There's one thing something. I've always wanted. So it, it was back in the, it was right before uh, that became a textile that uh, fashion houses started to put into their mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. my idea was to basically, you know, ha have a. a source material production facility and then also have it as like like you know people go to like dude ranches for like a vacation and stuff and have it be like a work farm where people could come and stay there and <laughs> and help tend the alpaca and other <coughs> animals um yeah and no, i was just i was just looking up the guy the doctor is julio sumar uh who was in peru not colombia um but anyway, this is bringing back memories. But the SoCal Alpaca Ranch is uh, still in the, the – it's in the two- to five-year plan. I can't believe uh, the alpaca stores that sell alpaca clothing. It's just – it's it's amazing. It looks like a Prada store down there. I mean, that stuff is very expensive. It's very highly desired. So Yeah, there's really nothing softer, I feel like. Like it's even better than cashmere. It's beautiful stuff. It's amazing. You know, and it's a cold manure for you guys out there. I don't give a fuck about the <laughs> the cashmere part of it. Uh, it's a cold manure. So like if you're a small time farmer, then obviously we talk about using the, the lion head rabbits. But if you're outdoors uh, and you're you're you know fortunate enough to have an outdoor farm, I would think about it or maybe at least research uh, alpacas and maybe think about getting a, a male and female and just kind of seeing where things go with that. Tyler, you guys have the land. What kind of animals uh, are you chasing around to collect their poo on the farm? Um, well, we've got a lot of natural, you know, do you, stuff do, that's do, going do you around. See the, there do you that, see the question? Uh, besides rabbit, what are common uh, manures? Um, like I said, some safe stuff, like Brian was saying, was rabbit. You know, the cold stuff is alpaca. You know, anything else like that is something that you're going to want to have you know, composted for a very long time, you know, and on farms, 
it, it's very common for animals to be treated with a uh, dewormer and dewormer will really slow down the composting process. Um, so you have to be careful what sources you're using from what animals are on the farm and what, what you're putting into those animals is ending up in the compost as well. So you really got to look at all four portions of that. You know, we've got a horse on the property, um, but I don't specifically go right after using that horse poop for anything, obviously, especially because the horse is treated with dewormer every year and it kills a lot of the beneficial bacteria in there, kills a lot of the bad stuff, most of the, all the bad stuff, but kills a lot of the good stuff as well. So you really have to be careful with that. Um, uh, so some of the horse poop that we'll use on the property is because it's been there for maybe eight, 90 years. And we've got these big, big portions where we go back and we dump it with our quad, with our trailer and, and have these big piles that are years and years old. And it's, it's amazing to see some of the plants that have busted out through those giant piles and stuff like that. So, um, I've even, we've even plopped some seedlings down into this um, big, you know, you know, eight, nine year old manure piles and just to see what they do. And we've all of a sudden have a big old plant sticking out be over the manzanita. And we're like, What's that? like, wow, they're just going crazy. Um, but uh, you really got to be careful with that stuff. It's like, you know, the older it is, the better it is. You know, you really got to be understanding of that. Um, a lot of what I know now, what I've learned about the industry is we're going to want to do some sort of a quick compost extract with stuff like that and get it into the soil as soon as possible. Um, everything that I'm learning from, you know, large, large farms, even, you know, growers down in Long Beach, like No-Till Kings, they've gotten away from long aided, long brews, and they do just a quick extract and get it into the soil as soon as possible. Um, you know, and, and sourcing that super, super dope compost or going somewhere and getting something, uh, an IMO or anything like that, and just saying, hey, let's let's get that into the soil as soon as possible. That's where it's it's meant to be. That's where that microbiology thrives. So um, let's not try to, you know, increase that population at all because, you know, maybe we don't have the skills to look at it under a microscope to evaluate if that population is beneficial or non-beneficial. Maybe we should just, boom, put it into the soil as soon as possible and let those things thrive. Um, that was a kind of the, yeah. the deepest thought on that. Um, and shout out to those guys, because it's always been the thought process or at least common thought process for a long time that 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours, supposedly, you know, that you're getting different things there. But the reality is I feel like a lot of people were having problems when they would brew that long. They would like the, the alphas, if you will, would emerge. And then you don't have that diversity that you started with, with what you're really the end goal you thought you were trying to achieve. So I was wondering if you could go deeper with that thought process on, uh, you know, how long are they actually brewing for? And then, you know, I, I would imagine they're still seeing that diversity when they're testing. Well, th this yeah. also, can, can I can I layer one thing on that question, which is with all the far I was going to. Well, with all the farms you've been visiting over the years can, and I'm going to use compost teas versus extracts as an example, what are some trends you've seen that have come but then transition to something else. Cause I feel like a lot of people who were brewing teas back in like 2017 are now doing S extracts. Uh, and it seems like the, the, the layer on top of Brian's question would be, why are they transitioning? Why are so many transitioning from what was the hot thing in 2017 to extracts today? Because of failures, uh, you're gonna see directly, you know, sites that I visited um, you know, when you've got this complicated brewing machine and you can't clean every single piece of it, and you can't sanitize every piece of it if it's not. And honestly, you know, some of these really high end people that are, are you know, brewing stuff in under the microscope in Elaine Ingraham, Ingham, excuse me, Ingham. Um, a lot of them will use a stainless steel small brewer if they're doing a long brew like that because it's a stainless steel brewer. They can guarantee no micro scratches that can hold microbes in there. Um, you know, uh, the only brewer that I suggest, uh, would be like a Synergy Agriculture one because the bottom piece can be removed and you've got this whole stainless steel piece that can be sanitized and cleaned. Um, and they also have, um, diaphragm pumps that they use as well. So, uh, Synergy Agriculture, you know, there it is right there. You know, if you're going to brew a tea longer than anything in an extract, that's, that's what I'd highly, highly suggest. Uh, that is, I believe, uh, Scott from Crescent Soil Services, his personal brewer. Um, take in mind, somebody like that, even with their own compost that they've made, I've had Scott tell me he's been in a facility like that right there, and he's brewed five teas 
and and it's the sixth one that didn't get tossed out that he used because it looked good under the microscope. If it's that hard for somebody who's a professional, why would we be doing that on a normal basis is what I told myself. I, I disqualified myself from brewing long ADTs in a certain sense. I said, you know, if I'm going to pay all this money for this high-end compost in this this 27-gallon tote for $200 or whatever it is, or I'm going to go source it, I'm going to do a quick extract and get into the soil as soon as possible rather than brewing it. Um, you know, any other sort of brewer that you build yourself, um, you got to understand is, is microbes, they're super sticky. Um, I mean, they're like, you know, super glue. So once they hit that side of the tank, you have some that are sticking to it that are never going to get into your plant system. You've got, you know, a vortex brewer that's pumping all around and vortexing. That's great. You're mixing everything. I mean, I, I look at these brewers as really being great nutrient mixing devices, um, you know, because, you know, we're really moving into soluble powders, um, you know, obviously with feedings and stuff like that. Um, you know, we've got an amazing product that we use, um, concentrated biology with uh, microbial plant food. Uh, but there's a lot of other companies out there. The most one of the really good ones out there you guys should be checking out is Organics Alive. They have some amazing soluble powder products. And I would be using those brewer, those machines to mix that stuff and disperse that out and just to make sure that that's constantly mixed beautifully. Uh, so I, I look at these devices as, you know, very useful, uh, but I don't think we should be doing elongated teas and brews. Um, you know, these facilities were failing because they were not able to clean these things and these populations were continuing to fester in a bad direction and not a good direction. Well, so that's kind of what I was getting at. So that tank uh, I sourced from Stout Tanks, which is a beer, you know, a conical uh, fermentation tank. And I was like, we'd like to use it for weed. And we, that, that was in Carpinteria at the uh, One Acre Nursery. And th that was, so in conversations with Scott back in the day, the idea was like, he w it was the teas, but do it in stainless steel because to your point of the microbes being sticky, in a plastic conical, which everybody was using plastic, um, you dry, you, it dries out. The, the bad microbes can stick to the any nook and cranny in the. I mean, think of you got the plastic, but you also have the tubing that comes out of it. And to clean it, you you can't like. There's a reason they use stainless steel in in beer brewing and yogurt making and other things. It's because you can sanitize it and it's stainless. Um, yeah. but, but I, I thought it was, so one of the issues we had was that thing was huge and to do kind of the quick brews that Scott started to focus on those, like, you know, not 48 hours, but like a much quicker process to, to pull that thing down the runway of a greenhouse, like that shit would tip, I mean, it would hurt someone. So it's kind of like, how do you do stuff that's in like super small container size so no one gets hurt so they can be quick and nimble um it, it's just interesting that and i guess my question to you after we finish on this one was what other trends like the tea to extract trend did you have you noticed over the past couple of years that you just find interesting i find uh the most interesting thing is um taking one of those quick extracts and quick teas and also beefing it up with some uh uh, let's say uh, some other microbiology, like a, a fungu uh, mycorrhiza that you're going to put in there in a transplanting kind of purpose and putting some humic acid in there, maybe some, some fish hydrolysate and taking your transplant, whether it's in a sleeve or whatever it is, and dunking that whole, that whole plant into that soil, or excuse me, into that five gallon bucket. So you got to kind of plan this out because you want kind of like a dry transplant in a certain sense that needs to be water, but this is the day you're going to transplant it. So um, with our concentrated biology pre-brewed compost tea that we have in a bottle, this last year we've been having a lot of people use that with uh, microbial food and doing a dip where you're dipping that whole plant into, the wa into that water with the mycorrhiza and then transplanting it into the soil outdoors. Uh, compared to the normal process where people are going to go around and just transplant a whole bunch of plants and then you got a guy going around behind you or you watering all those plants in to make sure they don't wilt. Because obviously if you when you transplant a, a, a seedling into a dry soil mass, it sucks the water out of that, that, that seedling and it just can, can wilt in a certain sense. 
you know, if you've worked on any California farms or just anywhere, anywhere outdoors, it's going to happen in Colorado too. You take a, a nice ceiling from outdoor and you put it into the, the, the sun outdoor. Hopefully you transition it for a little while and some shade cloth and everything like that and, you know, give it a chance to, to you know, really feel the sun and, and you know, get to that. Um, but taking that plant and dipping it in the mycorrhiza compared to dusting a hole I, I think there's a huge wasting thing going on in the industry where people are wasting, you know, mycorrhizal fungi that's just supposed to be like, you're supposed to be able to use a little tiny little piece of it and it can colonize a whole plant. Why are we dusting a whole fabric pot with, with mycorrhiza fungi that's so hundreds of dollars per pound? Dude, you're, you're um, you making know, me so. feel bad right now because I'm like, fuck, I, I do that all the time. <laughs> but yeah, I also, yeah, I, I also have tons just... of free samples and stuff. So I'm like, woo. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, for me, I think that's the biggest trend that I've seen is these cannabis farms can take even shitty plants that have looked like crap and have got purple stems that are phosphorus deficient. And, you know, they're, they're doing this little dip and then they're transplanting them into the soil and there's no transplant shock. And these plants are just punching right into that soil and taking off. Um, you know, we specifically have some customers that are just jazzed up with that process and, and using extracts for that, using their IMOs for that, using some amazing humix for that, some kelps, you know, so, um, that, and then personally, I, I will never grow cannabis without doing, um, micro my, microbial foliar sprays, um, and really covering the plant often, the, uh, with, uh, obviously beneficial microbes, because we can, we've seen, and we've proven that, you know, the microbes will survive on the leaf surface after that, that material is dry. So if you spray a compost tea on the plant and it dries that those microbes are still there alive and, and, and functioning with the plant, even though there's sun on it. Um, so that, that's one thing that kind of blew me away is, you know, is and and obviously the last couple of years I've done done it really successfully by covering in veg and up to like around week two or three into flower uh, doing uh, these foliar sprays with microbial products um, plus including food. So you know I I don't want to spray a plant with something like Suff Oil X or with Greener Cleaner or with one of those other brand products unless I've like okay. Oh my God, I need to save this thing. This is, this is bad. This is a breakout. This is what's happening. Like I foliar spray my plants to feed them um, and push them further because, you know, I look at, I'm doing a root drench with microbes and plant foods on Saturday. And then during the week, I'm going to do a foliar spray to cover the leaf surface and also allow them to feed through the stomata of the leaf surface of the plant because the leaf, the plant can, you know, feed just as much off of the leaf surface as it can the roots. So why aren't we feeding it in both of those ways? And why aren't we, you know, going in between those and treating this thing kind of like a NASCAR and pushing it further. Um, you know, that's kind of where I, what I like with my, my cannabis plants is I've even gotten to the point to where I will not plant outdoors into my final, you know, raised beds until about July 15th, uh, any sooner. And my plants will be growing into my greenhouse. Uh, that's how progressive some of my, uh, my stuff is going. Um, uh, so, you know, and every year I'm doing my soil testing. I'm doing my recommendations. Uh, most recently, I've used the soil doctor. Uh, he was just on here, the Future Cannabis Project, a few weeks, about a week ago back. So make sure you guys go check out uh, Bryant, uh, the soil doctor. Um, I think he's um, really able to handle the masses. Um, a lot of the other consultants have been amazing. It's just they just re really bog down sometimes. So for the basic person that needs to get a soil test done on a two by four because you want it to look like jungle boys weed, but in your grandma's basement, like get it, son. You know, you need to do soil it, testing. It, 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 just, just, just hold on a second. If I wanted my soil to, or if I wanted my plants to look like jungle boys plants. <laughs> Sorry, I'm making myself laugh right now. <laughs> No, I mean, there's definitely no, no you know, farms that I've visited in, you know, indoor that just look, you know, and I just say that because like for people who don't know living soil, but you know, cannabis, you know, that's just going to be one of the major brands out there that produces, you know, quality indoor cannabis, you know, for the masses, you know, um, I would love, you know, I walked into TLC before it was Jungle Boys and all that stuff back in 2015 and brought them some of our fabric pot transplanters. And they said they are just walking away from fabric pots and have just really embraced um, uh, 
uh, going to rock wool and stuff like that. So I just caught them just kind of right at the end of that stuff way back in the day. Um, but, uh, that was actually really uh, a cool experience. I got to ex explain because I walked into the, the dispensary down in downtown LA visiting one of my friends and I looked over and there's a dab bar and they're giving away dabs for five bucks. And I'm like, okay, I'll take a dab. So, you know, I'm there like, uh, I've never had a dab outside of anywhere of somebody's house, let alone in, you're in like a club, a dispensary, blow your mind. So I know uh, Brian gets to experience those great things out there in Colorado and stuff like that. But way back in, you know, 2014, 15, that was just a freaking experience, man. Well, those were pre-COVID days. Nobody's uh, dabbing the public out uh, right now, I'll tell you that. That's true. Even at the Emerald Cup, I walked into the Puffco uh, booth and uh, they're giving out frosty dabs so they were loaded up my puff coat with some uh, frosty solventless uh amazing amazing flavors absolutely amazing. yeah the the D the dcc cracked down hard on pretty much everyone there so in terms of sharing really stuff with each other yeah i mean the guy's got like a a knapsack level bag you know not even he's not coming in with his industrial bags right and they're harassing sun grown mids and um peter well I, yesterday i didn't have this we were trying to talk about it but peter you're obviously there so i feel like i should you should talk about it yeah i know that the, all those videos that uh trevor's been posting those were right at our our booth and i had walked in and i was starting to set up my camera gear and I saw uh, Ja Rome, you know what's good, uh, who's from LA. And uh, I went in to give him a hug and I like gave him a hug and basically like, as I'm, I'm hugging him from behind, so my head pops into the middle of this like circular conversation with a bunch of people with Trevor next to him and uh, bam. And I was like, this isn't a happy, fun conversation because it, it was with it was it was when I realized what was going on. It was the DCC had just stopped Trevor, and uh, and and it was like one agent, then two agents. I mean, the video that I shot was the one where you, I was trying to show just like the twelve agents. It like complete overkill of like surrounding <laughs> one stoner dude with a backpack with not even full of weed with like, you know, mason jars that have weed. I mean, like, it's not a lot. Um, I mean, it's not like back in the day at, when we had, you know, pounds and pounds sitting on a table in the 215 days. It's like, for that, me, that was, like, that was amazing. Yeah. But I think uh, a lot of people, if you've never been to the Emerald Cup, and you went this year, I, I bet you had an amazing experience and it blew your mind and it was great. You got to see some amazing people. But for people like me that, that uh, have been going to that event for four or five years, um, it's, it's sad. It just really is going in a direction that, that people, you know, are, it just sucks to kind of see them crack down on people that way in those small farms. You know, this was an area, this is an event. This is a time when they're supposed to be given a safe space. You know, it's like the community has come together and this is a safe space for us to do things and learn and educate. And it's like, you know, if, if anything, this guy should have been like, hey, like, you know, these are the rules. This is what's going on. Yeah, I'm really on. sorry. I, really I don't mean to be the bad the guy. Like, yeah. like, can you just bring it you know, back like, outside? Hey, like, like, we're transitioning into this new space. This is where it's supposed to be. This is what you're supposed to be doing. Like, you know, like, instead of coming down with 12, 14 agents, like, they're lucky there wasn't people riding on them. I mean, if people in the community really knew what was going on right then and knew that was happening, oh, every, everybody they, they would have gotten over, overwhelmed. Right. Oh, yeah. it would have been just like, oh yeah, they would have they would have walked out. They would have been like, okay, we're out of here. Like, see that? Yeah. The the, the the thing yeah. we talked about the other day was the fact that they have they have discretion, and so the idea is you can either be as much of a hard ass or as lenient within a certain, like, to your point, the most lean, the most lean would be just turning the other eye. Like, we know, like, whatever. Uh, the second most would have been your thing, which was like, I'm really sorry to be that guy because I don't have any problem with what you're doing, but the rules are, and can you, like, maybe take it back to your car? You can come right back in, blah, blah, blah. Um, I, what I'm trying to do in the background, because to your point of what things used to be like versus now, 
is I want to get the various cons and this is all like I don't give a shit. Do you, do you remember the sat? I don't even know which the, the 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 hall that was furthest away from the two halls we were mostly hanging out in the L.A. hall, like the hall that just had all the well-funded uh, brand ne next to Area One Hundred One. Oh. It, it, it was a, it was yeah. a night and day. The the two halls on one end of the fairgrounds were like the old school people. It was like the the hippie hokey like like farmer. <laughs> you, you felt like you were hanging out with a bunch of farmers. You went all the way, you know, and you had to go through the pouring rain, but like all the way to the other end, right next to Area One Hundred One, which is like the oldest old school people, was like the flashy L.A. exhibit hall of you know, like the vape pen brands. And um, it, it, was a, it was a weird contrast. But what I want to do is, is have a conversation where we bring, like I reached out to Nicole Elliott, who now has Lori Ajax's position as head of the BCC, to be like, you need to come on and, and just listen to a bunch of farmers like I, I was talking to Lindsay from Aloha Humboldt, like they, they've done everything right, which is they crush, you know, brand identity. Like if you were to launch a brand in any other industry and just do all the right things, it's like we have a great looking brand. We have great looking packaging. We're growing great flour. We're we're marketing it. We're we're owning the social media and they're barely surviving. And they're like, this is insane. We're doing everything right. And, and, and we don't know if we'll be around next year. And I think what I want to hear from Nicole Elliott as the voice of the BCC and therefore the regula like the main regulatory agency in California is, do you personally care that small farmers are around in a year, two years, five years, 10 years? Do you want that to happen? If the answer yeah, is yes, if the answer on camera is yes, then what can you do specifically under the current regulatory framework without things having to go back for some sort of Senate or, you know, like a bureaucratic process and a vote to allow for, you know, and then have the small farmers on there too, being like, if we could just do X, Y, and Z, if we could have farmers markets where we could sell, if we could, you know, give away free samples without it being, you know, just like, like whatever they say to her, like these three things, which are very reasonable. If we could just do those three things, we'd at least, you know, the, the, we, we'd have a better chance to survive. And the question is, can those three things be approved within the current framework or do they need to go for a vote? But like, to, and then getting like the Tim Blakes and uh, who runs events, Right. Because if they could show people their weed at events, which is the whole point of this conversation, they can't like Trevor got harassed as a, as a dude with a backpack. So did all all the 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 old legacy brands in that one hall. I mean, we're interviewing one after another right now because they all have the same story of just getting fucked with by the DCC. At that event, so it's like events are, you know, if a farmer's market is one example of like three simple things that would be really helpful for our survival. The other one is at events to be able to fucking smoke people out. Like, like they, they couldn't, they, they had to have, I think like eight size tamper resistant jars on display. The person like us walking by, who's like, Oh, like, who are you? Let me get to know you better. Um, couldn't touch the jar like I, I and, and these are my friends like I even tried to touch the jar like no 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 don't touch it because we'll like they're watching <laughs> we'll get in trouble and they had to hold the jar for me to look at it I mean that that's like it, it, it's it's about as stupidly overbearing as like completely unnecessary it's not like there are like six year old kids like coming by the booth and walking off of the weed. So anyway, that's uh, Brian. Since we don't have Leighton here today, I took the rant duties. Uh, <laughs> I, I I bore that burden. That 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 is a cause worth talking about and ranting but, about. But 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 it, it <laughs> I my my whole thing is we can fucking change shit. I I believe it and, and like I want to do it. Like I want like use for me like the thing I can use is this platform 
to make them not be able to hide. Like, yeah, I always view it as, and I don't mean that like uh, Nicole Elliott is a cockroach, but li li like, for example, with, with uh, you know, sheriffs in whatever county that are harassing people, it's like, let's fucking put their pictures and names up on, I mean, it's all us stoner people, but like, we can get shit out there to make them uncomfortable. And or at I least think answer with, people's questions. Yeah. So, so, so with the sheriffs, it's like in El Dorado County, <laughs> the sheriff is, uh, w which one's D'Agostini the sheriff in? That's, uh, that's El Dorado, right? Augustine, yeah. Like, Augustine. you know what? Remind me to pull up a picture of him. Let's look at his picture. But like to, to cover it and to like go interview him and be like, Hey, you're busting all these hardworking people like who aren't doing anything wrong. Like, do you have a comment on that? Like you, you hit him right outside the Starbucks as he's like starting his, his sheriff shift in the morning. Well, make shit uncomfortable you know, for him. For those people, you know, and I've, uh, I've had, you know, some quite a experience with some of those people too, myself and that side of things too. And, and it's the, you know, for them, they get to see the worst side of it too. So, and then for them and their mind, you know, they've been to the worst, crime scenes that involved a little bit of cannabis, you know, and for them, it's been, you know, a bad situation. So if you were to get his opinion on it, he's going to be able to tell you about all of these really bad scenarios that he's witnessed. You know, they're never going to talk about the time when they come in and busted a small family grow and cleaned it up. And, you know, just off of the fact of doing that, you know, so. I found two in Colorado. There's a huge <laughs> that, that just quickly that that's John D'Agostini. Uh, I believe we we're in El Dorado County. Um, and I, I believe this is the same county that the sheriff's department got in trouble for raiding a uh, hemp grow. And there's a big major lawsuit going on because they took down a whole hemp grow without yeah. knowing that it was a hemp grow. So now they've kind of, I think, halted a lot of their pursuing of, of breaking down the small farm or just because the simple fact that um, they're being sued for lots and lots of money because of their negligence. So I, I think there is in process a lot of change going on in that, that, that vicinity, in my opinion. So how do we reach out to that gentleman? Well, so, so I years ago did this story on uh, these two guys in Placer County. Um, sorry, that's so in Placer County who had a legally compliant farm and were raided by an out of county task force, like not, not Placer County. It was called Trident, which was El Dorado, which is this guy. Um, that happens Sac a lot, Sacramento. And I forget the third County, but it, it was like with the DEA. So, so they, they were working with like the West coast field office, which I think is based in San Francisco and Placer as a county was like, we, we're in on cannabis, you know, because everything gets to be decided at the local level. Placer was in. And I hope I'm getting the county right. Is Winters in Placer County? Uh, no, that's that would be in Yolo County. Yolo. Holy shit. Thank you for. Yeah, it was Yolo County. <laughs> I think Placer was one of the three county task force. But so in Yolo County, Yolo County decided at the you know, board of supervisors level, we're in on cannabis, we're going to allow cultivation licenses, come apply. And uh, these two guys, Red and I'm blanking on the other guy, uh, went through the process, had a farm, and they were like the poster child or the poster farm for what compliance looks like in Yolo County. And the whole county from a government, you know, board of supervisors to all like the commissioners, like uh, the agricultural commissioner and the water or whatever, um, we're all on board. And they would like go visit this farm and like bring, you know, news crews through and, and this out of county task force with that guy uh, as one of the people came in and raided the farm, chopped 1800 plants down. I want to say like in August or something. So, I'll be, <laughs> uh, the entire crop and, um, so and, he's and, huge and, on the other side of things. Oh yeah. And, and, and I, there was not a single, so this is the, the flashlight to cockroaches. There was not a single news story on the topic. And I sat there patiently. So I talked to one of the, 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 I think it was the agricultural commissioner, 
um, who told me the story of what happened. And I was like, that is fucking insane. And it wasn't covered by the press. So finally me, like in my, you know, <laughs> my, my home office, I uh, started digging into it and I started interviewing the farmers. I interviewed their lawyer. I interviewed the county officials. And then I started reaching out to the other side, like the dudes who led the raid. And they're like all proud of it. <laughs> and then I also was reaching out to the like the Winters Express. That's why I remember the town of Winters. I was reaching out to people there being like, hey, do you know this happened? Like, this is a big deal. And um Eventually, they covered it, and, and they, they at least wrote a story on it, and, and their kind of headline was, you know, a case of new regulations and law enforcement and farmers not really understanding, you know, like the new... Reg Basically, they, they, they thought of it as a miscommunication, and I was like, oh, no, <laughs> law enforcement knows exactly because it wasn't the internal. Remember, it wasn't Yolo County's uh, sheriff's department. It, they knew exactly what the law was and they fucked with his people. They fucked with them because they know they can get away with it because no one's going to say a thing. And I was like, I'll say something. And uh, and so I, I I mean, it took for fucking ever to like. You know, I wanted to, if I was going to write something, I didn't want to have like inaccurate information because then people could dismiss your whole story. Like, oh, you were, you know, inaccurate on that one thing. Like, what else are you inaccurate about? So I was like, I need to nail this. And it took me months to write the story, but it, it was an insane story of, of, and shit like this still happens. I mean, Christian got busted in uh, El Dorado. Yeah. Um, Christian, if you're I watching. Personally. I, I did get your text and just call me, <laughs> just call me. Cause I'm going to forget about it in 20 minutes. I'm like a, a, a goldfish with my memory. But, um, so I, I think with, with, with like Chris, uh, Nicole Elliott and that stuff, it's, it's, it should start more as like, uh, we'd like to break bread with you as a community. Because I don't, I don't think the idea of like yelling and screaming at the DCC, you know, because then someone just digs into their position. So it's kind of like, hey, like you guys were a little heavy handed at the Emerald Cup. Like, we just want to talk about it. Like, you do you know you don't need to be that heavy handed? And like, maybe it's, well, because, yeah, it's like maybe it's because each of those agents personally is like morally against cannabis. And like, that would explain it. But it's like, if you guys aren't, Cause it was all like all the agents were probably in their thirties. Like they're not like, they're not like, <laughs> they're not like John D'Agostini <laughs> who, who looks the part of like, if you're like, does that guy, is that guy pro weed? It'd be like, fuck no. Right. Like all these agents yeah. were like, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll try to cue up the video, but, um, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> The biggest issue I feel like too, especially when you go to events is the cops feel like, you know, an, an ounce is a lot of weed. And to us, we don't feel like that. So especially when you want to show it off, uh, you know, especially at an Emerald Cup type event, you know, you're there to kind of show it off. That's your shining moment. Especially I almost say that as like a, a beer festival or something, right? You want so many people to try it so that more people find out about your brand. For a lot of those guys, like we said, they're not necessarily on social media as big as they should be. But here's a chance for the public to be able to supposedly uh, smoke and taste your stuff so that they can be like, wow, man, I remember this certain brand. Uh, that, that's something that I feel like is needed for the small time guy. And I'm glad that we're continuing to bring this up on multiple shows, because if that goes away, then there really is nothing left. I mean, there's no way that yeah. big corporate cannabis is ever going to turn to it uh, and, and say that. And, and the best all the time. And for anyone watching, like, I know this is tedious shit, but it's important. So it's kind of like, I'd like to just talk about smoking weed and like <laughs> what you're smoking and how awesome it is. But sometimes it's like this shit needs to be dealt with. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's like when you're a kid, it's like the vegetable portion of your dinner, right? Right. Because if you don't talk about it, you don't, you're not going to have dinner. Not gonna be well, there needs anymore. to be, you know, uh, after that whole thing, I was, you know, uh, the, um, what was it, the Beard Bros? 
on Instagram, they have a really awesome, it's kind of like a news feed for the cannabis industry, uh, the Beard Bros. And, and I always go to them for some of this stuff. And they're kind of laying out the pathway that some of these small farmers do have is, and what they can do if they're not a licensed farm, which is some stuff that I've never even read before. So, I mean, the, the, we need to have those people on there from the BCC to educate us what that pathway is. Because, you know, we're talking about people that will not tear into these laws, you know, and read books for hours to figure out what their pathway is. Like, we need to come onto these forums and say, you know, hey, if you're a small farm under these qualifications, you can come to an event and do X. You can't do this, this or that, but you can do this. You know, what is that? You know, what 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 is that pathway for us? I think is, is really important because there's so many amazing farmers out there where I come from that have not been given a pathway to success. And um, you know, it's sad, you know, I, I spoke to a guy the other day that contacted me cause he had some really cool design for a fabric pot that he wanted to do. And, and he honestly thought that one idea was gonna propel him into a, a position in a full-time job somewhere just because of this one idea he had and how he had this like, dream of, you know, coming forward in the cannabis industry and having this path forward. And it's just like, you know, it's if this person would have been given a clear path just to been able to do what he wanted to do originally, which was grow cannabis and be able to retail it or sell it or, you know, bring it to some, you know, ability to, to be rewarded back for it, I think it's just, just sad. Or you're forced to partner with cookies to survive. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So, yeah, so, j so j just quickly, this... Look at how many agents. Look how coordinated it is too. I mean, they got all the jackets on, and then every now and then you'll see somebody hanging out with them that's dressed in plain clothes, and that's the one you want to pay. That to. was that dude. That was that dude at the very end talking to him. Like you, you wouldn't know he's an agent, but but my my point is, do, for one dude with one backpack, look how many agents they felt it was necessary to have come swarm. It's insane. Yeah. I don't want to get into like political kind of stuff or government kind of stuff, but it just comes down to too much government, in my opinion. And we should, there should be less government and more people given to the chance to just to be ourselves, in my opinion. I think there's too much government trying to govern the people, um, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah someone said I, show of four. I mean, that, that's it. That's what they were it. doing. So, downshifting. Do you want it? Are we, are we ready for our, faci our facility yeah. tour? Yeah, definitely. Let me see if I can turn some stuff around here. <laughs> master master, the master of here. the camera flip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, you got to hit the drop down. It's hard on a phone. Do you see the drop down that like camera? Yeah, selection? Gotcha. You know what I think? Yeah, look at that. All right. Okay. So first thing I got to show you guys, uh, we've never boxed our stuff. And we've never really been prepared for being in a hydroponic store. We've always just sold direct to people. Um, in the last few years, we've made a big effort to get into, not to get into hydro stores, but prepare ourselves to be into hydro stores. So in the future, this is the first time anybody's kind of really seen this in public. This is what our individual raised beds are going to be boxed in. That's a new version of the grassroots logo right there. Sorry, and, and, the, uh, and, and these boxes would be stacked up in a hydro store for someone to put in their cart and walk out? Exactly. Yeah, so this is going to have a barcode on it. It's going to be completely retail ready, has everything in there besides the PVC pipe, um, all the information you need. We got I, some I, cool I, like, I like the tomato plant on the, as the uh, illustrative plant. Yep, yep. You got to be careful with what you put on packaging nowadays. Um, you got to be real careful. So that's the fab. Uh, that's for raised beds, obviously. Um, and then this is for our fabric pots. So we kind of want to weaponize our followers and say, hey, man, you know, you need living soil pots out there in your local stores and local areas. And Grassroots is a great brand to go with. And we've got some cool stuff to go right along with it, guys, because we love living soil. This is I mean, you know we, ninety percent of what we make now is living soil Scro products. Scro so. Scroll up on that uh, box. You know what graphic would go really well with all those? Uh, I know those are all just grassroots. I, I thought you had other brands. I was gonna be like, put an FCP. <laughs> but it's but it, but it's all grassroots. I I thought you had. Uh, 
other brands up there. Never mind. Carry on. Uh, and then our uh, micro builder, our pre-brewed compost tea. This is our new packaging for what that's going to be. There's over 20,000 different uh, bacteria and fungi in the liquid compost tea. And it has a one-year shelf life. And then this is our plant food to go along with it. So our super food. So this has got over 100 different kinds of uh, food for your microbes and for your plants. Uh, that powder plant food activates the microbes in the bottle. And that is to be immediately used on the soil or if you do a compost tea, you would use that at the very end of the compost tea and apply it to the soil to make sure you're getting that beneficial biology. So this is the first look at all of this stuff here. Um, we're getting ready to launch our new website and all of this branding in probably mid-January. So uh, I'm at the Emerald Cup. I was handing out some shirts. I gave Peter, I gave you one. Um, keep on planting on. We've got some cool stuff with another peace sign and uh, some cool sweatshirts too, as you guys can see. Some awesome high quality stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess I can bring you guys through a little tour of the warehouse real quick, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. Now I've so had a lot more success uh, using your products with worm farming as well. I just wanted to put that out there. With uh, worm farming? Yeah, with uh, like the moisture lock thing. When um, it seemed like when the uh, baby composting worms would hatch, they would crawl through yeah. the fabric uh, of like yes. cheaper fabric pots. Um, so I just wanted to put that out. That's my own personal testimony. That's money that I spent on your product. But I just wanted to say that while you're kind of showing these things off of why you're a little bit different than just regular fabric pots. Yeah. And the one thing that's really important that I'll show you guys right now um, is our fabric that we use is from the state of Georgia. It's 100 percent American made. It's from the same company that makes the HESCO barriers for the U.S. military. Um, so anybody who's been in the military, uh, we obviously offer a military discount for, for anybody there. And they're very familiar with this fabric. There's uh, Sebastian, our head cutter, cutting everything up here. Ask Sebastian, yep, tell Sebastian, or uh, ask him if you can uh, help out and see what he says. <laughs> can I help Sebastian? Nah, nah. <laughs> <laughs> He's off. Look how no organized this too. is, man. Yeah, they actually, they uh, they call me the tornado. So if that lets you know uh, how much they want me to help, that's what they call me. So, you know, they don't need no tornado in here. Um, did you see 20 on there? These are 20 gallon. Uh, these are going to be 20 gallon living soil sides. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay. So uh, sidewalls for your 20 gallon pots. We obviously make sure we can get uh, the maximized amount of cuts uh, per roll of fabric. This fabric is very consistent. Because it's American made. What what's what's the fabric made of, or what is the fabric? Considering we cannot use hemp because it will not process through our sewing machines, um, this is a polypropylene. So this is a non-woven geotextile, and it's created in the beginning as a tan material. It's not dyed. Uh, in the very beginning, these are like look like little plastic tan beads uh, that are kind of melted down and stretched out into a fiber. Uh, they're uh, heat pressed. That's what gives it this texture here. Uh, some fabric pots, you'll see a fluffy side and a hard side. Uh, that's because one side is heat set to give it its structure, and the other side is fluffy, they say, to attract roots. But actually, that's just cheap manufacturing. Um, ours is heat set on both sides, so it can be, it doesn't stretch, doesn't pull, doesn't change consistency. Um, uh, definitely the best fabric we could find in the world. Um, and they produce it to our exact quality, our exact thickness. So um, amazing stuff. And that's amazing interesting. So, so hemp at that same thickness just is difficult for the uh, cutting equipment to get through. Is that what you were saying? Yeah, yeah. And take in mind any hemp fabric that we've had is a blend. Um, anything 100% uh, hemp is going to immediately start falling apart once it hits moisture, hits water. So... Um, this fabric is going to last for a very long time. If it's not, you know, in the sun, if it's indoors, I mean, this stuff could literally last forever or buried in the soil could let, literally last forever. It's the sun that breaks it down. So, you know, hemp, even if a, a blended hemp fabric, it will not process through our sewing machines. Um, our sewing machines are pneumatic and they actually have scissors in them. So as they sew it, they trim off the extra fabric uh, for the sewing process. Um, so we've tried quite a few versions of hemp, 
um, and it just does not work or hasn't worked for us in manufacturing process, plus they immediately fall apart compared to something that lasts for a really, really long time. So if we did something hemp, it would have to be twice the price uh, just because of the cost of it and the manufacturing compared to this stuff. Um, kind of have like a list of issues of, of why uh, the hemp doesn't work, unfortunately. And uh, here's some of our raised beds already boxed up, ready to go out. Got some of our fabric pots up there. There's just some of our basic inventory that we keep on hand. Everything from transplanters, those are Velcro sidewalls, uh, 15 gallon, five gallon, and one gallon. We've got some black fabric left up there. We've pretty much stopped manufacturing with black fabric because it's not requested anymore. So we stopped purchasing it. Once we run out of back black fabric, we're gonna be done. Um, also start some of our raised, uh, raised bed inventory down there. We obviously keep things very organized. Is that from heat issues with the black? Outdoors, heat issues, yeah. Um, and when you're um, not a legal grow and you're trying to blend into the hillside, this tan fabric is going to blend into, you know, the dirt and the outdoor area a lot better than anything else would as far as camouflaging yourself. So, um, plus, um, you know, one person you should probably have on here is uh, Eric Branstad from Greenhouse Advisory Group. Um, he's one person that was very instrumental in the reason why we have tan fabric. Um, he was one of the original ones with a heat gun going into a greenhouse showing the heat of a black fabric pot and black ground cover in a greenhouse compared to white ground cover and a tan fabric pot in a greenhouse. You can have 30 to 40 degrees lower uh, leaf surface temperatures and also internal temperatures in the greenhouse. So uh, setting your greenhouse up properly with the right material and the right fabric pots or the right color fabric pots is going to make a big difference. Definitely. Um, but yeah, we got one of our guys down here processing a four by four raised bed, doing his thing. Got some quality control going on as well. The four by fours, these are made two inches smaller so they can fit into a drain tray. Some of our sewing. This is a five thread dual needle safety stitch that is not going to come apart. The really high quality stuff. So we're boxing up four by fours to get out there. One of the bigger issues, too, Tyler, when you're buying uh, like pots where your, your focus is the living soil, is after a while, uh, it seems like things just kind of do in a way break down and pulling on the handle after a while. Sometimes that will rip and it will rip like a huge hole in a, in a pot that you've been working on for six months, a year. Uh, and then usually you have to transplant that pot into a new pot and kind of start over. So uh, for newer farmers out there, I feel like you need to do your research and kind of invest in quality. Obviously, uh, you know, you're saving a lot of money, obviously, if you're going living soil on, on the, on the back end. So there's money to be spent on the front end. Because you don't want to disturb the soil. I feel like that's definitely my personal belief. I know other people believe uh, differently, but um, I, the easiest process, I feel like, is when you don't disturb the soil and you're able to then uh, focus on the variety of other things you need to do uh, to constantly produce high-end cannabis. Yep, great points. You, you want a container that you're not going to disturb, uh, especially if you're going into a large raised bed, that's a soil mass that it should be put in its final resting place in a certain sense. I like I like to look at it like that. Is uh, you know, you got to put it in its final resting place and let it function for as long as possible. Let that soil, um, you know, have its succession and move through its processes that it needs to go through and really benefit the plant in those ways. So, I really fi finally think we have great marketing behind all of these great products, and I really hope. Um, Everybody watching here gets out to a local hydro store and tells them to contact Grassroots and say, hey, we need some Grassroots Living Soil Pots in our local stores. Um, we're a small company, um, but we're going to do what we can to get these Living Soil products out to people. So while I was joking about the tomatoes, I actually did grow a tomato. I actually just ripped all the ones out. Uh, I need to plant new ones, but I just went outside. Oh, sorry. I was just talking and I didn't... Re All right, let me start that over again. There's, 
There's Rich Quinley, the owner of Grassroots. Rocking the new sweatshirt, too. Soil Life. So, Rich, can you hear me? I like that. No, Rich can't hear you because I got headphones in, but uh, I can ask him a question for you. Yeah, so the, the same question, uh, my very first question to him at the Emerald Cup was, uh, how psyched were you when the uh, weed community discovered your, <laughs> your product and what's that done for business? So how psyched were you when you, when the weed, uh, say that again, how psyched were you when you found out your product serviced the weed industry in such a successful way? Did I say that right, Peter? And, 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 and how's that worked out? We enjoy making things that people find, find uh, useful. Did yeah. you guys hear that? We did. That was a very diplomatic response. Very diplomatic. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, in some ways, it was kind of, uh, it took me back to my to, to uh, my youth, and it was just kind of a fun thing. It still is. Does, does hanging out with Tyler keep you young? Does hanging out with Tyler keep you young? No, he makes me older. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I got the gray in my beard. <laughs> yep, we're a small company, though. There's a few of us here. But, yeah, that's grassroots, guys. We're not Amazing. a big corporate company. We're a small family yeah. company. and uh, It's good to see, man. Sure serving others. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, so no, that's what we'll I, I, I love. I love working with and supporting small companies. I, I don't really have much interest in it's like big companies don't really need help. So I'd right. rather find ways to work with smaller companies and do stuff together than like bring on advanced nutrients as uh, <laughs> as the, as a uh, like. Yeah, what would you bring them on for? <laughs> But yeah, uh, well, we so haven't been in uh, any of those big magazines or you know any of that stuff. Like pay, we, pay, we paying for an ad on like the the inside front cover or whatever. But uh, so while you guys were yeah. talking earlier, I went outside and I didn't realize I was uh, I was muted. So that's why I threw that video up because I thought I was not muted. Um, oh, sorry, it mutes me when I show the video. But uh, so so. I wish this would slow down. How do I? Oh, that's where there are no controls to like pause this. But anyway, a lot of these, uh, like the, what is that? 65 gallons and then the 30, right? So these I've been slowly building up with my compost. So um, that's some Luobo radish. But these two front ones are entirely... Com like worm castings from my worms, compost uh, from my soldier fly and uh, thermophilic. And like, look at this stuff. This stuff doesn't really get much sunlight because it's the winter. So like the sun can't really reach it, but that's, so I'm letting all that lettuce go to seed. Cause I want to give like when people order stuff, I stick in vegetable seeds, but uh, whoop. And um but like that shit, I mean, did that look unhealthy? No, it looks very healthy. It looks very happy. Well, sorry. You got to You got to un. Here, let me unmute you. Oh, you got to unmute yourself. But so this is the other one. But <laughs> I've been slowly filling these things oh, up. Wow. Uh, this all is going to seed. Uh, Yeah, that's, uh, I got like rye popping up in there. That's the doggone, uh, 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 Tyler trees gave that to, that to me, but, uh, it smells amazing. And that's a, that's watermelon radish in there. Some Swiss shard carrots in the front. Uh, it's really going to be a jungle this spring. It's going to be crazy. That's all my little bait. These are the babies that I have to move around. Um, but anyway, the, the, <clears throat> it's fun wanting to make my own soil and like having to patiently wait for compost to finish before I can fill the next, cause you need volume, right? So like you could buy a ton of bag soil, but if, if you're making it, like I need to wait for the worms to do their thing. And I'm like, hurry the fuck up. <laughs> I have another, yeah, I yeah. got 60 gallons to, to, you know, it's a lot of cubic footage. That's of, another uh, another reason to have a, a good EC meter, uh, like a probe EC probe, so you can go around and be qualifying these different sources of compost. 
you know, to make sure that they're at a proper EC and they're not at some insane levels or anything like that and to see if they're still composting. So, um, you know, that's another reason to have some of these great tools like a, an EC probe, uh, a pH meter, a combination pH meter. So you can be looking at your PPMs or be building foliar sprays. Um, you know, very important to have the right tools to successfully, successfully do living soil, in my opinion, over a long-term successional period of time. And someone asked uh, what the white pots are in the video. They're, I mean, so this gets to, I think, what Eric was saying was like, I, I live in SoCal, so, you know, you put shit in black pots and it just bakes in the summer. And I'm always like, why does everyone make, like, can't you buy white pots? Like, maybe for northern people, the black is, like, what you're going for. But it's like, everything dries out so fast. And so that's why, I mean, those are just, I, I got them on Amazon. But what, what I like about those ones is they're not flimsy plastic. They're actually, like, thicker, so they last. And, um, yeah, okay. So the, the beauty of SoCal is that <laughs> the entire year you're, you can be growing shit. It's like, not, you know, I came like from the Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Yeah. I'm like, what? I can grow things all year. And so now it's weird trying to figure out what stuff like sorghum you can't grow in the winter, you know, like obviously you have your winter rise and grains and stuff, but, uh, like sorghum, I guess, and I'll find out because that's what th that stuff that looked like corn is sorghum. And I didn't know that you're not supposed to do it in the winter because I guess it doesn't have enough. If I understand what people told me correctly enough, it needs more energy from the sun to really produce at the end. Um, but I didn't want to kill it and not find out. So but then I planted like all the rye and barley and farro are uh, are starting to sprout. That's why a lot of those those uh, pots were like a little bit barren because I cut other stuff out and the and the winter grains are popping up. But uh, no, it's it's fun. I mean, to be able to go all year outside is is fun. Well, one of the problems I noticed when you do have dark pots, um, it seems like it reverses the way Mother Nature actually works. So it's like it's drying um, on the on the uh, top instead of at the bottom. Did Tyler fall off there? Yeah, no, he's, he's coming back. Right. Sorry about that, guys. Anytime I get a phone call, it just kicks me right out there. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so I was I noticed like when you guys were saying about the you know especially the the, the black pots that. Uh, it's like a, it's the reversed way of what things dry. There's there's pockets of dryness. It's almost like reversed in the way Mother Nature does things. Um, and I, I I guess I'd always assume that it's from heat and the fact that uh, unless I had and was, was using composting worms, I just always had huge issues even growing in fabric pots. It just seemed like it was kind of a struggle uh, to really get them going until I started to really actually add the, the life to it. Uh, but I was wondering if you could talk more on that seems like when you do go with the cheaper versions, uh, it really is just a piece of fabric. And so you uh, can potentially have a lot of issues um, uh, with going cheap, especially again, when you're thinking long term. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, for years, even our advertising, we, we focused on air pruning and how air pruning was so beneficial and so amazing and stuff. And it, it turns out that air pruning was a myth in a certain sense of how beneficial it was because a normal fabric pot dries out from all sides and angles, you know, like the sun is drying it down from top down, which is natural. Um, but then it's got fabric all the way around it. So then it's drying out from all these different sides and angles and even bottom up, which is a completely unnatural drying pattern. Um, there's, there's nothing really in nature that dries out like that unless uh, there's, you know, a plant that thrives in nothing but sand because that's the only thing that dries out from all different angles, top and bottom like that. So, um, you know, for a long time, there was people that were just like, yeah, these fabric pots suck. And we're like, well, you know, 95% of people say they're awesome. So it's like, you know, whatever. You're just that weird person. <laughs> you um, didn't say you but... suck too. <laughs> <laughs> Once or twice. I'm just kidding. No. Um, it was always some crazy dreadhead guy up in Humboldt that was just like, you know what? These things, they just bleed out water from the sides. They suck. That's why I grow in the soil. That's why I dig dirt. That's why I do mounds. That's why I do this. That's why I do that. And we're just like, cool, man, we're not going to win all you guys. Like, that's awesome. 
you know, and then we kind of discovered, um, went down the path of obviously uh, Steve Cantwell from Green Life Productions and uh, Scott from Crescent Soil Services. Um, Scott, you know, was the first person to order fabric pots with the liner in them. Um, and, uh, and first of all, they obviously started lining fabric pots on the outside with saran wrap. And that really, um, obviously, if you have a normal fabric pot right now, you know, anywhere, any size, you know, all the way up, I think it's just kind of pointless once you get to, you know, a couple hundred gallons because you've got so much soil mass insulating itself. But anything small, um, take some plastic wrap, some saran wrap from your kitchen and wrap the outside of that pot with saran wrap. And people were seeing mushrooms pop up in 24 hours. So, you know, we're putting I, I, in this I, biology. In my beds, I have mushrooms popping up all the time. It's, it's constantly, cool. yeah, it's, it's natural. So it's like you've started that process of beneficial fungi being able to cultivate, colonize, and then fruit, have a fruiting body. That's what a mushroom is, is the fruiting body of, of fungi. So, you know, where's that going to be in five years from now? And we've already achieved some fruiting bodies of beneficial fungi, uh, you know, popping up, you know, it's going in a positive direction. So, you know, we immediately changed paths a while back and we saw such these amazing benefits of people saving water saving 20 to 30 percent water just because it's not drying out from the sides um obviously the biology they're putting in there is is there but now it's been given away it's can colonize and thrive um you know which is, i think is the most important thing um but simulating nature has really always been our goal with this product and you know allowing our customers who can't grow in soil because you know the current state of cannabis is we're you know, right now, if you really want to get into a legitimate side of things, you're going to go into a local municipality, a local county. You're going to try to get a license and they're going to tell you where you can grow. It's not like I got the perfect spot. Now I'm going to apply for this license and do this or do that. It, it really, unfortunately, doesn't really happen like that. It usually is the other way around is in, you know, these are the areas you can grow in. And we're going to have you grow in this area because when we send our inspector out there, they can hit six farms in a day. And that's what we want. We don't want them spending one day going out and visiting one farm. That's a waste of money for the local government. They want to be able to go out and visit all these people within a local area and be able to touch them whenever they want. So, you know, having the growers centralized in an area is a goal of a lot of these different licensing counties and towns and, and cities. And, and you'll see that everywhere in every state that you go to. We first saw this when, you know, uh, things became legal in Washington, one of the first states you know, in America, but they publicized their license list. They straight put it out on their website. And um, I got to admit, I, I went up to Washington and I started knocking on doors and dropping off pots and doing this and doing that. And a lot of times they were very open to it. And a lot of times it was pretty, oh, pretty, uh, uh, you know, like, hey, they didn't want you here. The dogs are out. So, you know, um, that's kind of that. Um, it, it, but just, just, on, just on this topic, like BAM uh, talks about Santa Cruz County where like, you know, Historically, people have grown in the mountains and Santa Cruz wants everything down in like, you know, the flatlands uh, and it's just like all commercial big supersize grows. Yeah, I have an email chain going with one of my customers in San Luis Obispo or somewhere in that, that Santa Cruz area, I believe. Uh, they built out a whole farm, six greenhouses, fully raised bed, living soil, everything, and then the county uh, one of their board of supervisors got voted out. Somebody new came in and they decided the next week that they were going to vote out commercial cannabis in their county. So these farms that are fully built out um, were ready to start producing cannabis and be on the, the legal market were just completely shut down in that county in California. What's the name of that farm? Um, I, I don't know off Could the top get of my to head. I, I, yeah, but could you get it to me? I'd love to reach out Definitely. To Definitely. Yeah, I've got some pictures and they're at the point now where they're just trying to get their soil and their raised beds and all everything else just sold for whatever they can to survive, to keep paying their property taxes. They can keep their property so eventually they can grow on there. So, you know, now they're having to cannibalize their own cannabis farms just to keep their property they started with. Um, so I'll definitely, I mean, uh, it, it's just, th this is a cataclysmic year. I mean, think about it also on the other end, the pressure of $400 pounds, right? Like, so it's just like you're like every direction you look as a farmer, you're just like, uh, that that's fucking me too. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, and you've got a, a tax. What is it? One hundred and fifty dollars per pound they have to pay as a tax. Yeah, the the tax um, went up, right? The tax that, and that went was up, that, that yeah. was written into the law. So that's an example of something that was written into the law. Like, no matter what the per pound market price is, this tax will go up to X dollars per pound. Uh, yeah, and that goes into One effect thing. now. I don't want to shock people, but you know, on the verge of happening here in California, which I did not vote for, I did not vote for the legalization of cannabis in California. I was completely against it, and I still am. I was always for the 215 days, but we're on the verge of our 10 to 20 acre cannabis farms being licensed and started up here in California. Um, no, 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 a lot we're of not on really the we're, we're, we're not on the verge. It's happening. So, like Glasshouse, uh, which is in. Uh, Santa in Carpinteria, so it was right Santa around the Barbara corner County. from from where we were. You know, they they and I don't really fault them, but I'd I'd like to have a conversation with Graham Farrar who runs it. Uh, so I went there when they had kind of this uh, four acre operation, and we filmed stuff there. And you know, but now they just bought. They bought, I think, for ninety million dollars, uh, the biggest tomato greenhouse operation in the world, which was in Ventura County, right around the corner from the greenhouse. Uh, I'm looking at, and uh, I don't know how many acres of canopy they're adding on with that, but I'm just like, it, it, it's like Graham. He he comes from the tech world of like the software world of like unicorns and venture capital and San Francisco and like growth, growth, growth at all costs, be the biggest, like, like big, 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 big. And my whole thing with, with cannabis in California or anywhere has been like, if ever there was an industry where it'd be awesome if it was the opposite of that and it was just all mom and pops. Cause we don't need, we don't. And again, Graham's a nice guy, but like, I don't need you producing 50 to 100 acres of of weed or nobody does like the and, and all those and this gets back to the small farmers uh but like that's where it's going you know graham's not stopping and if he if yeah. he's growing if he's growing 100 acres of weed you know maybe not all by next year but the next year like so in 2023 and by the way keep in mind he gets you know he gets four turns a year so he so in 2023 i bet he'll be close to that 100 acres of just pushing that production into currently he can only sell into california so he's going to flood the california market and and then add in um in santa barbara central coast agriculture they're huge i mean you just have these huge operations popping up and and they're not stopping so anyway no yeah they're not stopping and i think uh, I've always looked to the future of, you know, federal legalization, um, you know, and allowing these pounds to transfer from one state to another, um, you know, is the big goal because then the California cannabis market would just change and go back to the way it was in a certain sense, because, you know, if you can export cannabis legally outside of the state and every, you know, dispensary outside of the state can have California cannabis, um, you know, they're going to have a shelf space for that and be trying to retail California cannabis and every other, every other state, which, you know, if you can move it at a state, then you can move it out of country in a certain sense. So, you know, I, I have hopeful things as in, you know, the price of cannabis and what our farmers can get and how our, our local small farmers are emphasized in this process and have a, a way to come up above this is, you know, the desirability of small mom and pop product on a large market, I I think is is overwhelming for uh, overwhelming in a positive way for some of these small farmers because you know then you get into like how what we saw happening into the micro brew industry and in, you know beer in a certain sense you know you're going to have all of a sudden that one or two main company that did really good and won some cups all of a sudden is going to be you know the end of the next eight oh five. Of beer, but in cannabis in a certain sense. So, you know, uh, I just hope that that path is moved forward a lot faster for people than what had happened in the alcohol industry, where it took hundreds of years for that to happen. I hope that process comes out a little bit faster. Got it. Uh, so I had a, a uh, text request 
Um, and I'm sure you're not going to be upset with this uh, topic. I'm going to throw a piece of red meat at you. Uh, oh, wait, that's, is that the right one? Hold on. Please have him talk about his nutrients. Nice, nice. So, yeah, um, our concentrated biology, uh, we're going to be kind of renaming that a little bit to the micro builder. Um, about three years ago, we partnered with a really cool man named David Olson that I was able to have on a future cannabis project here. I've kind of made, nicknamed David Olson is like the micro man. Um, well, David Olson, his father, um, about 20 years ago, was approached by NASA. And NASA had brought to him saying, hey, we've got these amazing bacteria that break down poop in our in our uh, in our spaceships. And I think they've got some huge practicalities in agriculture. Uh, so David's father was the first person to bring a, um, a microbial inoculant to the market in the agricultural space over 20 years ago. Um, David Olson obviously was following in his foot father's footsteps. Um, he's also done some really cool things as he's also an advisory for um, the local fishing industries on the West Coast. So all the way from Alaska down through the Bay Area, um, he's advising people on the fisheries and how to maintain a positive amount of uh, fish in the fish streams and having a good ecosystem. Um, his uh, biological report actually stopped um, the major canals going in in the Bay Area. Um, there was a major project where they were going to take water uh, from the Bay Area, move it down to SoCal. Uh, his report proved that they were going to kill over 15 different species um, of native and non-native animals and insects uh, throughout that process in moving the water uh, unnaturally down to Southern California. And that was most recently done along with uh, uh, some tunneling projects through the water there uh, that uh, were very important for his um, environmental reports. Um, but David, uh, has, does his own vermicompost. Um, his vermicompost is, is really awesome. It's got about five different types of worms in his vermicompost and we feed it, um, our microbe food, uh, which has over a hundred different kinds of plant foods in there. Um, Gosh, I think it was back Indo Expo maybe two and a half years ago. Brian, when I saw you, you were across the way with blue mats. Uh, and I gave you some of the micro food at the end yep. of the event. Was that, was that, how long ago was that? That was right before the uh, whole pandemic started. It was like our last little hurrah because uh, unfortunately that, that gentleman passed away uh, as well, the guy that runs Indo Expo. Oh, gosh. Is that what happened to that event? I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why it's not happening in January. But that was like our Super Bowl for those that don't know, or at least in Denver, yeah. it felt that way. Uh, it was when once a year, everybody could really get together. Um, maybe our little Emerald Cup, not on the same level at all, but just when people were connecting, you get to see each other once a year um, at the Indo Expo events. Uh, yeah, and that's when I saw you, man. You were over there hustling. And it was pretty cool to see, you know, because you could, yeah, you know, you spend a lot of money on those booths and um, it was that was right at the time where I really started to, to see from the other side of things. And, you know, usually I'm on the other side talking to people, talking about their booths, uh, but just looking to your left, looking to your right of how disengaged some of the more soup type uh, products were and their, their salespeople uh, where you were actually engaged talking to your, uh, your customer, potential customers um, and giving out free products. And that's, that is something that, uh, like I said, man, it, I know Leighton and I are just always about trying to give the platform to people that uh, that continue to educate. And for you, man, I know you've been on here uh, multiple times on your own, but I just wanted to also kind of give the platform again so that people can see that there are a lot of good people out there in the cannabis industry uh, looking out for you in a way uh, that just wasn't there, uh, you know, for the longest time. Because as far as I know, when we were really getting into the, the, the synthetic side of things, it wasn't really mom and pops anywhere to be found where more of these kind of products have allowed the mom and pops to emerge. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what, you know, David Olson is a, is a mom and pop operation, mainly serving into the agricultural industry is a pre-brewed compost tea with micro food that's made to cycle nutrients. Um, you know, uh, so strawberry farmers have been using this down in the central Valley before they plant at a couple gallons per acre, just to really bump start that nutrient cycling before they go to plant. 
Um, and this goes back to, you know, some of the great results that we were having and using this product in a, a transplant dip where we're dipping the whole root ball. And if when I have a cutting, I'll dip the whole plant, clone everything all the way down into this mixture of compost tea, microbe food, and mycorrhiza that we put together and then move it into its next home. Um, you know, starting the plant out with the right foot forward is, is probably the most important thing you can do. Um, so these products are, are made uh, right here in Sacramento at David's facility. He's got, uh, I believe, 20, 2,500 gallon brewers that he can start up and brew and, and make batches of this stuff as he needs it. Um, but uh, it starts with a small, about five pounds of compost tea in a compost tea uh, extract bag in a brewer. Um, David's got some really cool tools that he uses to monitor, monitor the oxygen levels in that brew. Um, and if you are brewing teas, one thing I want to key into is if you're looking for a really awesome air pump, you should look into um, spa pumps. They're about two inches wide and they're about this big total. They plug into 110 and you can put enough air into uh, some extra air into even a 2,500 gallon brewer and get a lot of air movement in there. Um, but, uh, David is using his Sorry, microscope. Je just quickly. Did you literally say spa pumps? Like that if you were putting a spa in next to a pool or something that you, okay, let yeah. me just try to find a picture. Yeah. So just Google, uh, spa pumps, uh, 110 or 220. Uh, generally you'll see a little unit that, that looks about the size of a football, almost the shape of a football. And it's got a two inch hole on one end. Um, these things move air. They move a lot of air and uh, they're industrial and they're only a couple hundred bucks. Um, hook it up to a two inch PVC pipe that's, you know, a couple feet long. Stick it down in the bottom and you get these giant air bubbles that will rise up and really, really move some oxygen. This next level uh, like from these the back things? in the days where we had the air pumps. Uh, no. If you cruise down a little bit, it's more of a small unit. Uh, let's see here. I just Googled spa pumps, 220 volt. Well, actually let's, let's try the 110. Maybe that, maybe they're more, uh, smaller size. Um, I see a spa. I mean, these ones sort of look footballish. Uh, no, they're a little bit smaller. I believe uh, when I Googled it, it was spa pump uh, with a two inch wide opening is kind of what I was going after. Yeah, that, that didn't help very much, but. How about small? This is still bigger than what you're visualizing. Yeah. So yeah, maybe we big. should scratch that. If we can't right. find it easy on Google, it's probably not a great, great option, but that's what, uh, one of the pumps that he uses David in his facility is a spa pump, uh, to two inch wide, uh, nozzle on there. And it's a little unit about this big and it pumps a lot of, a lot of air into, uh, those brewers. Um, but we use uh, one thing that's that really kind of blew my mind with this whole process is he can brew his compost tea product and then stop feeding it, keep brewing it and put it asleep into stasis mode so it can be bottled. And it has up to a year shelf life onto it. Um, we've asked, actually left this stuff outside in the sun and we've had 70% life still after 17 months. Um, so microbes, once they become stable in a stasis mode, they can become very strong and very durable for a really long time. Someone said search for air pumps. Uh, well, I was going to say the classic, that gray one right there in the middle, that's kind of what I feel like a lot of people are used to for the air. Yeah. Pumps. That, that gray one in the middle is what a lot of people kind of do. But I would imagine, I mean, then that, that did pump out some pretty nice air. Cause when you, if you really go back in the day, we were using, uh, like cheap fish pumps from Walmart uh, and it just didn't seem like it was able to actually like move the water, which I had learned is really what you're after is to kind of get it to resemble like going down, um, a river. Yeah. Get that, get that movement moving there. Air moving. 
Yeah, I'm not seeing. I'm trying to search for it on Google too on my end. I'm not seeing it. Let us there. deputize all 200 plus people watching to help us find a link to <laughs> what we're looking for. <laughs> Well, some of the um, other things, if you guys uh, find it, otherwise I got a, I, I felt like a kind of a fun topic because it's uh, something that, um, you know, I personally disagree with, uh, but you were saying that um, like pHing and stuff, you're really, uh, you're really into that. And I just found that pretty interesting. And I was hoping maybe you could uh, speak on that a little bit differently on why with a living soil system, you're so focused on what the, what the uh, meters are telling you. I'd say it's because of people that are failing in some places. Um, you know, they've seen, you know, when their soil's too drenched and your soil pH is up above 6.8, they start seeing root aphids. Um, and if you don't start adjusting or monitoring your pH, if it gets above those certain levels, you're locking out nutrients and then you're creating bug problems. Um, you know, I, I learned this a lot the first couple of times I did some soil testing with Logan Labs because you know, sitting down with a consultant, they said, hey, your soil pH is at 7.1. So right now we know you don't have all your nutrients available to you. So right now we need to try to fix that soil pH, get it down in between 6.3 to about 6.5, somewhere in there, so we can get that nutrient availability back where it needs to be. So I'm so conscious of it because I've been having so many issues with it from the beginning is saying, you know, if I want these plants to properly produce for me and to, you know, have the best genetic potential possible, they have to be within that range in the soil pH. Um, and, you know, ways of monitoring that is, you know, what's if you have, you know, a couple of drips of runoff or if you have a way of poking a hole in the side of a bed and sticking a meter in the side of there, which is common for a lot of people to do. Um, I've even installed, uh, done custom orders where we've done grommets on the side of beds so people can stick probes inside of there. Um, you know, I, I think the, the goal is to get this system rolling like a big wheel. Once we get that soil pH in a positive realm and we get everything rolling with our moisture levels, with our biology, it's kind of like a big wheel rolling down a hill. That wheel just collects stuff that gets bigger and bigger. It gets worm populations. It gets humic acid layers. And we get to soil succession. And honestly, at that point, soil pH is probably going to be so less of an issue because every time you pull a soil test, it's always in those great realms. You're not thinking about soil pH. It, it's just the process in the beginning of when you're putting that bed or that pot together and you're mixing that soil yourself. Or you're sourcing soil from, you know, one of these amazing people in America, you know, let's say build a soil or sustainable or excuse me, or Kiss Organics, you know, um, any of these amazing companies that, you know, there's uh, trust me, there's somebody out there that hates them. You know, I, I work with all these soil companies. There's always somebody who doesn't like somebody. But the fact is, is there's great products out there, but you still got to manage those in the beginning and take those the that data and write it down and make sure it's being managed in the right direction to make sure that wheel is building up and getting stronger and stronger because these systems are going to get to a point where you can't stop it. Um, it's going to maintain moisture for so long that if, if you died and there was a apocalypse, you'd probably walk into some of these situations. They'd be thriving because the grower left and got the hell out of the way. You know, I mean, you know, that's what it kind yeah, of thank you for clarifying. I, I, I wish I had a cheat sheet of who hates who in this world because, uh, fucking every I'm like, oh, wait, oh, yeah, I forgot that guy hates that guy, and they're having like a cat fight right now, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we don't yeah, look out for right. each other in this industry, I'll tell you that. Very what few. were you gonna say, Brian? Well, we don't look out for each other in this industry, I'll tell you that. No, no, no. Uh, before, the, but when I cut you off, you were about to say something. Oh, I love that. <laughs> It'll come back. No, but I think monitoring these things and, you know, if you're doing this on any sort of a realm where you're trying to put food on your table and, and profit from it, like there's no reason you should not be looking at these things and be taking down data on a weekly basis and having a journal and, and having this stuff down uh that you can go back and reference you know i have got some mentors of mine that are long-term growers that if they have issues they go back to their grow journals from years ago and compare their notes now and be like oh well you know what when i was transplanting i didn't do this and i forgot about it that's probably why this didn't work out you know so you know recording this data down having this data 
you know, doing a saturated paste test on your soil where you're sending in your water and your soil and you're allowing the laboratory to combine them together and evaluate the nutrients that's available to your plant. Just like if it, you know, they were there to your grow, they're evaluating what's available nutrients to that plant. Um, and how successful are you going to be? Like it's, you know, a couple hundred dollars to, to, to take that weight off your shoulders and allow a laboratory to tell you that you're going in the right direction. Um, especially employing somebody like Bryant, the soil doctor for $45 to look at that and give you a four page write up saying, dude, you're going the right direction. We need to address these minerals. Let's address this pH a little bit and you're rolling in the right direction. Um, so, you know, so can uh, you, you did that with them, right? Yeah, definitely. So, um, so, so can mean, you talk about what the, like when he looked at your report, like what, uh, he told you you needed to do? Yeah, I'm, I'm constantly battling um, high pH levels in my soil. Um, I also have three different raised beds that have three different types of soil in them. So <laughs> from three different sources. So I've got a little bit of an experiment and a little bit of an issue. Each bed has to be uh, tested separately and amended separately every single year. Uh, one of the soil masses I got was from uh, the Kraft farmer. Um, he had a grow in Calaveras County that was shut down and he had to just get rid of everything within a certain amount of time or the county was going to come in and, and start finding him. So he put on social media, hey, I've got this amazing soil. I'm a KNF farmer, 110 bucks a yard, bring a trailer. I mean, I was there like a couple hours later. Uh, so I was there hanging out with uh, Kraft Farmer Lance and his beautiful farm there as he was shut things down. And uh, I got a bunch of his soil. And I've uh, produced some some amazing personal product out of uh, out of craft farmer soil, um, and it's it's uh, been very blessed to be able to uh, carry that soil on and, and make it successful in my own farm, as well. Um, but yeah, getting getting back to that, each one of my I kind of created my own problem by putting my system together in three parts because you got three different soil masses, three different chemistries of soil that I've got to address every year. So. Um, I do three soil tests. I walk down the length of every bed. I take a couple handfuls off of the top three to six inches with gloves on. I mix it together in a five gallon bucket and I send out, uh, I put two cups into a plastic bag and I mark it bed one. Uh, same thing for bed two and bed three. So they're all categorized and marked. Um, and then I bottle up uh, some water right out of the garden hose that feeds my soil or right out of the irrigation system. Um, and I'm sending that into Logan labs, um, about a week after they receive it. Uh, typically I want them to get it on a Monday or Tuesday. I'll get my laboratory results back on a Friday after I pay for the invoice, be prepared to pay for it to get your info. Um, and then you get an email with, with a, a matrix in my opinion, that's what it looks like. You got all these numbers, all these values, like you can do all this stuff to educate yourself and learn about it. And uh, for me, I, I recommend people go to the soil, somebody like the soil doctor. There's several people out there, depending on where you're at. Um, and a lot of people, you know, that are getting uh, trained up by e Elaine Ingham, I would highly recommend, you know, getting a part of her program as well, because they're going to have all these benefits to you and more. Um, so going through that process, you know, every one of my beds has to be amended separately. And, and the most part that I'm amending is not MPK, is not nitrogen, is not phosphorus or any of those other things. It's actually minerals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we found and we know, it's common knowledge now that the cannabis plant is really good at remediating heavy metals from a soil and removing heavy metals from soil. So it was made very evident to me several years ago, the benefits of, of um, amending, um, you know, these different sulfate minerals, uh, which are non-organic uh, sources into your system and take in mind, I've got a soil report saying I need to use a non-organic substance in my soil to make sure that it is organic. Um, you know, cause you've got a soil test saying you've depleted factors. Well, the only way to add those, those other pieces in there is a non-organic form. If we were to overuse those, then it would be considered non-organic in a certain sense because you've used too, too much and you're poisoning the soil and poisoning your plants. So, you know, that's one big pill I think a lot of uh, living soil growers have to swallow is at a certain point you do have to use some synthetics or some non-organics to, you know, remain organic. Um, but I can tell you, if you go through the process and educate yourself on your own soil um, and go through somebody like the soil doctor, like Crested Soil Services, like Grow Roo, 
Um, you know, there's a lot of different places that have got services to evaluate your soil and to tell you that it's going in the right direction. Um, you know, that that's one major point to people being successful and reusing their soil for many years and actually getting to a return on value, a return on investment that's so compounding. You know, you can't beat it anywhere else in any other form of growing uh, is, you know, if you factor into doing this grow, whether it's a tent or whether it's 30,000 square feet, and you're going to factor in the cost of your soil and your beds into that initial build out. Um, you know, and a lot of other ways of growing, if you're doing synthetic, you're going to have also a cost of running per month, which in a synthetic grow with rock wool, you're going to obviously be replacing that rock wool every, every run, uh, restarting it. Um, and then you're going to be cleaning that whole system as well and redoing it. So you have that, you know, less return every single month compared to a living soil system that maybe just needs a little bit of mineral amending. That's very easy to do. You know, some sulfate powders you put into a barrel and, you know, sub pump and garden hose it out to the soil mass. Um, you know, the first couple of times doing that, I'd highly recommend taking another soil sample just to make sure that you've actually improved those numbers or changed those numbers where they need to be. And um, for the long-term growers, we've really seen that uh, you get into this pattern of like, yo, I'm running ice cream cake in this bed. Every time I do that, it needs these amendments. And I go through that process, everything's running great. And I see these growers, they go through that process a couple of times with soil testing and they, they find patterns. And if people are in cannabis industry are really good at finding patterns and, and uh, catching onto those niches. So, you know, they'll back off soil testing because it's just a pattern. I'm running cake in this bed every single time. Well, it needs these amendments every single time. You know, they do, get down do to- Do you consistency. remember any of the uh, like cultivars that people have noticed like are specific in terms of their what they're uptaking out of the soil every single cultivator is going to be a little bit different so you know we've, we're finding facilities uh like the most recent one i visited in nevada fleer cannabis we talked about them a couple of times uh living soil facility uh that steve cantwell started uh that now is ran by uh evan matrix uh on instagram um their facility is is just amazing with the succession it's gone from 18 inch beds down to 24 inch beds and the improvements that they're seeing and you know it's every strain is going to be a little bit different so much so that they have to test every bed in that facility because it can be a little bit different but just like all the other living soil growers that are going through all this testing they're finding commonalities they're finding patterns and it's in the people that are that are able to keep consistency will see those patterns if you're having to get clones and different cuts every single time from a different person every single time, you're never going to be giving yourself a chance to find these patterns and to be able to really learn a plant and to understand, you know, what this process is. You know, if you want to get to somebody who or get to be a person who can win a cup or win one of these things, you talk to those people. They've been working with the same plant for a really long time or the same grouping of plants for a really long time. And they freaking know them. They know them so well. They know when it's healthy. They know when it's unhealthy. They know when it's underfed. They know when it's overfed. They know when it's, oh, shit, mode. we've got to spray something or I'm not going to do anything because it's just like doing better than it's ever done. So, you know, if you want to get to that level and that quality as fast as possible, I would employ data. I would employ science and I would allow people to help you, um, you know, and be that open book and say, you know, this is what I don't know about cultivation of cannabis. For me, for a long time, it was I didn't understand humidity and pH. It's so funny. I mean, for years, I didn't understand that stuff. Um, and now I've got a huge grasp on it and I can come into somebody's grow that's, you know, just starting out and putting all the pieces together. And there's so much to understand. There's so much to do. You're going to miss a couple little things. So it's important to be able to have people that can pop their head in there and be like, well, what about this? And why aren't you doing that? And, you know, where's your dehumidifier? Where's your humidifier? You know, what are these levels at? What's your VPD? How close is that light to uh, the plants? You know, have you transitioned these things properly to, to meet full sun, you know, to be transplanted so they're not shocked or, you know, the leaves are ripped up? Um, so many different cool factors that just, energize me in doing this job that I get to do and answering these phone calls and helping people out, honestly. With one of those, I feel like your views on flushing, I was wondering if we could talk about that because I felt like they were, uh, you know, again, different than mine, but I like the open dialogue uh, because I like seeing more what you're talking about and understanding more from the other example of where pH can get to 
And I, you know, in a way, I guess I can understand that because we're also talking about uh, on our side of things, like being more pro proactive as a, a cannabis farmer is really the way to be successful. Otherwise, you do have a lot of issues when you first kind of cranking the gears and getting everything to start running up. Uh, so, yeah, I, I appreciate you breaking that down. And then I wanted to kind of get next with flushing and you kind of talk about your views on that and kind of maybe we can go back and forth a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, once I employed soil testing and science, you know, I had this mass of soil that was going in the right direction and it was properly mineralized and was producing an amazing product that had no, no pest issues. So like the, that's just the end goal. That's just like the all holy thing that we can all, if we can all get to that is to bring a plant from A to Z from beginning to end and not have any pest problems. That's like my end goal. That's the all holy trinity that i'm trying to accomplish here so um for me flushing when i had got this soil mass into that perfect area and saying you know you've got the right amount of nutrients for flour you've got the right amount of 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 mpk the right mineralization um we would recommend just sat keeping this soil saturated so the plant can thrive from it and treat it like a kitchen so I sat down on that and, and, you know, my dad, he's ready to go like, cool. We're in the last two weeks. Like, I'm just going to start watering a little bit heavy and we're not going to feed. Everything's going to be fine. And I was like, dad, what if we just chilled, sat back and just kept the soil moist and just rolled through it? You know, let's see how it is. And he was really worried about the cannabis being harsh, really worried about the end product not coming out correct. And um, luckily through the cannabis project future cannabis project luckily through hash church and my my pursuits of of my own personal hash projects and and uh glory there um i found that it was really in the, the harvesting the actual taking of the cannabis in the field and what process it goes through to be hung and what it goes through when it's hung dried and cured um how long it's allowed to sit and rest and marinate in its own smells in a big tote with everything else before it's actually delivered out to somebody and brought out. So, you know, I think our hesitancy of growing a product and just trying to, you know, have some profit off of it has a big balance in between, you know, properly drying, curing. Like, I mean, I've seen some amazing uh, cannabis grows and amazing cannabis grown in the field and it just turns to hay and has no smell because of how it was harvested, how it was moved from the field into the harvest room and how it was dried and cured and not taken care of properly throughout that process. And I've seen it the other way around where there's just horrible growers out there or a grower that'll show up once a month to some shitty grow, but then he's got this amazing, amazing harvesting and drying process to make good cannabis. So you can fail in some points, but when in your harvesting, drying and curing and, and be doing really good, you know? So I, I think there's definitely some certain points that, that really, have to happen to be successful there. Um, so I hope right. I touched on yeah. flushing. Yeah. So you're like, from your experience, you kind of feel like uh, it's wasted effort. I mean, my feeling. Well, like if I flushed my soil, I would see this beautiful black water coming out of the bottom of it. And, you know, in my mind, those are beneficial bacteria. That's humic acid. That's, you know, that's my soil and solution in a certain sense, leaving it. And, um, you know, I, you can see the EC levels go down, the electrical con contuity in between the soil go down and you want, you know, a certain level of connection in between the soil. Um, obviously, you know, we know beneficial fungi can put out, you know, a radio signal in, the, in a certain sense and has, you know, a positive charge to it. So I wouldn't, we want a nice positive charge to our soil as well. So everything can communicate and that that fungi can actually you know go forward and move throughout the soil system and connect these plants together because it's not roots that allow these plants to communicate together it, it's beneficial fungi that allows these plants to to share nutrients in between each other in a network of fungi not a network of roots um, you know if we can employ beneficial fungi the root system can be 30 percent smaller and be just as efficient so um, I'm all about how can we make these plants more efficient in their own systems? Well, and building up the, the biomass and stuff like that, I feel like 
you know, maybe some people view it differently with the fact that they almost see it as a fast for the system itself. Uh, and then some people feel like they want to improve on that fast by giving them some sugars uh, to kind of finish out that process to kind of let you let those diamonds shine. Um, so I know, I know there's a, a variety of different ways to kind of look at certain things, uh, but it does seem like from a living soil standpoint, uh, once those things are dialed in, flushing is way less of an importance um, or, or how you view the system, I guess, then, you know, when you're putting a lot of uh, inorganic ingredients, synthetics, I've personally felt like uh, it is extremely harsh uh, if, if the uh, average grower isn't um, flushing or, or even going through with like this sugar flush. So I do feel like part of what we are kind of going back and forth here is maybe more apples to oranges. Uh, where like a living soil system is just constantly feeding you really see the fade i was wondering maybe we can even talk that ab about that a little bit as, as well because you know these are fun little conversations and i feel like the more that we actually just open up dialogue instead of saying like hey i believe this shit," and then once you once you start to say something that i d disagree with you know I, at least it seems like in 2021 then everybody's ears just flapped over and they didn't want to you know open up their minds to a variety of things that could potentially be going on right now. I feel like from a grower standpoint, sometimes it is that way where somebody has a certain view on our, our growing style and they don't want to hear any other sides. Even when we've uh, brought on farmers that, that grow synthetically, uh, they were asking like, what is the value in that? And I, I couldn't disagree more with the way that they were kind of coming at me because I feel like if, if someone is farming cannabis and they are very good at that and what they are producing, you know, is not only beautiful, but also recognized by the community, you know, it's sold in stores. Uh, why wouldn't you want to listen to to someone that is doing it in their way? And for a lot of those guys, it was, you know, if you've been doing this for like 25 years or something, you know, I feel like you're, that's how you're dialed in. Um, and for the most part, you're probably going to run your operations the way that you have things dialed in. Um, but coming full circle, I feel like you're able to see things on both sides. You're seeing living soil farmers. You're also seeing some guys that are probably running a variety of different styles. Um, but the cannabis, that's, I guess, more what I'm getting at is I don't want to, I don't want to pigeonhole and say like living soil is the only way to do that. But I do want to put a caveat and say that if you're going to choose a different style, in my opinion, it's going to take you a much longer uh, process to get there to be an elite farmer. Uh, just with some of the overall uh, issues and problems you're probably going to have when you're trying to dial in a system. Yeah. You know, if somebody handed me the keys to an indoor facility right now and said, you got to cultivate, it's probably going to be synthetic in the beginning as far as, you know, some sort of uh, rock wool cocoa or something like that, just because I know I need to get money in out the door. I need, to, I need to grow cannabis right now. And if I were to order soil beds, order everything to fill this whole facility right now at once. I couldn't even do that. It's, it's probably impossible to get the amounts of soil you need to get them bashed properly, to get them mineralized correctly. You know, so, I mean, I, I personally know of facilities right now that have a, a goal of moving towards living soil room by room as we can acquire the right pieces for that puzzle to fit in there. So, you know, like if you hand me the keys to a facility right now, I'm going to start growing cannabis however I can based off of what what I can source and how I can get it. And, you know, that's another thing that I see that's really big in the industry. Once February, March starts rolling around and supply chains start getting busy and things start getting hard to get and stuff's not moving from China, people start getting really antsy and they start figuring out you can't get what you want when you need it. So, you know, uh, keying back to that flushing thing a little bit too. One point I want to say that's very important is you know, in my mind, if you're thinking about flushing, you're not thinking about the next cycles and how you want your microbes to be charged up and you want to preload all the nutrients the plant needs ahead of time into the soil because you've got to flush that out and you've got to get rid of it and you've got to clear the plant out because maybe you've got some issues there. Um, you know, so like people like Brandon Rust in Oklahoma, He's getting very popular on social media and had a great time at the Emerald Cup. Um, he's all about doing soil testing and preloading those minerals in your soil ahead of time. So that next crop can treat that soil like a kitchen and get what it wants when it needs it. You know, um, people like him are, are, are not battling pests like some other people are that are, you know, going into this saying, hey, 
you know, I'm just going to wing it with living soil. I'm not going to look at these stats and I'm just going to go through the process and we're going to do water only. You know, I, I, I don't think that's, that's realistic in all situations. I really don't until, like I said before, you've built up that big wheel of nutrients and moisture and beneficial biology. And it's rolling at a point to where if you forget a watering, it's fine because it's got enough soil mass and moisture and beneficial fungi to keep everything going. And it almost wants you to get the hell out of the way, you know, and that's, that's really, I know the goal of a lot of these cultivators, whether it's Steve Cantwell from Green Life Productions, all the way to the guy just running a four by four, you know, tent with a four by four bed. We all want to get to the point where that soil mass is charged up and creating its own humic layers. And it's got its own benefits, benefits to it that are just mind blowing and are compounding factors that, are producing, you know, quality cannabis on a genetic level we didn't even know existed. Um, and there's so. another farmer we haven't talked about, Joshua Steensland. I feel like, we, you know, if you're if we're name dropping during this one, I feel like his name definitely deserves to be up there because he was one of those. Um, Mountain Organics is another one, but I feel like those yeah. guys were really the pioneers, or at least putting it, putting the information out there and explaining it to the masses, where we can, especially at that time, start to understand how this really worked for for my group here in colorado we were trying to build a living soil system off of like fox farm and you know trying to churn those soils and um you know it is what it is you know i, I know that sometimes people don't want to talk shit on products but that that product just never was able to become alive it felt like you know you just wanted to start from scratch uh, and maybe that that's really what uh from a living soil standpoint is is that you really do need to be the, the home cooker if this is your kitchen then you need to go out of your way to get as many ingredients as you can from scratch go out of your way hopefully to get local things um, and just kind of build your system and good things take time i know that everybody wants to rush everybody wants things to happen as quickly as possible but uh, cannabis is definitely a thinking person's uh, game uh, these need to be chess moves that you're doing or you're going to have a huge problem um living soil for me is if you're if the whole crew buys into it you know it's that system uh, you're going to eventually hopefully be on the way like uh like a steve cantwell or josh steensland i think he has something called like ohio factory so i want to give those brands shout outs because i do feel like those were the pioneers and now here we are a few years later uh, and these these people are kind of carrying the torch for what what everybody's been saying but was almost kind of dismissed for a long time especially on the forums until everybody kind of dialed it in there wasn't deficiencies you could scan the room now with social media with being able to post videos and i felt like more and more people at that point started to buy into the system or at least try it and now here we are you know the train is actually on the tracks and it is it's full steam ahead i feel like for a lot of people and a, a lot of people that are getting into this as wanting to grow it as medicine yeah. And I would like to, I uh, remembered you raised a point a little while ago about the fall fade. Um, a year ago, I, I posted something on my social media. I'm not sure if it's still there or not, but about how, like, I feel like the fall fade is a myth. Um, you know, I, and I discovered that with uh, SAP testing. I had been doing a lot of SAP testing with Logan Laboratory, excuse me, uh, with New Age Laboratories um, in New Haven, Michigan. Um they're they're absolutely awesome and they've taken in i think just this last year alone over ten thousand samples for cannabis and hemp so what they see is just amazing and, and looking at your nutrient levels compared to what they're seeing in the field and seeing with healthy plants is just definitely a, a game changer so um you know a, a year and a half ago i employed that for the first time and i started doing uh foliar corrective foliar sprays based off of that sap testing uh, I was sending in leaves from the bottom of the plant and sending in leaves from the top of the plant. And they were comparing uh, the sap from the bottom to the top to see what nutrients weren't making it to the top of the plant. Because when we look at the top of the plant, we always have the fresh greenest growth. It's always the best looking. The bottom of the plant always has those nutrient deficiencies. Well, that's because it's, some nutrients is hard to move up through the plant. Um, calcium, for instance, is a, is a very difficult one to move if it's not, you know, in your soil already or in your plants. You know, calcium is a great building block uh, for cell walls, you know, compared to nitrogen and, and other sources. Um, but uh, throughout that process, um, yeah, I was seeing my boron levels were low, my iron levels were low, um, and I was doing corrective foliar sprays throughout veg and in the flower. Um, preventing those things from happening. 
Uh, it wasn't until the last couple of weeks where I was getting close to harvest where I decided that, you know, hey, these plants aren't going to be done when I think they're going to be done. And they actually need like four weeks more instead of I thought this was going to be the last two weeks. Only at that point when I stopped doing that and went through that extra two week process because they weren't done, I noticed some fading because I'd stopped foliar spraying what the plants were asking for or needing for because those things were not yet available in the soil. So, you know, we can put things in the soil and we can amend things in the soil. We can top dress things in the soil. That does not mean that they're actually going to make them up into the plant surface and they're actually going to be processed by the plant or they're chelated to, to make it into the plant and actually be usable by it. You know, a lot of these things have to be consumed by a microbe and pooped out to be plant available to make it into the system. So, you know, we need to allow time for those things to happen for, you know, these microbes to process these things to for it to become plant available. So, um, you know, knowing these levels, knowing these things and using science, I think is um, if it's available to you, you should do it. I think it's kind of like the cheat codes for growing cannabis and living soil is like, hey, we're going to use some tissue testing. And we're going to use Bryant, the soil doctor. And, and, you know, after six or eight months of working with him, we've moved in such a positive direction that I'm not doing any IPM anymore. I'm mainly feeding my plants and moving them forward in a positive direction. And I'm not thinking about bugs. I'm, you know, there, there is facilities like that, guys. Take in mind, there is places that have moved forward in, with this data in such a positive realm that they're not thinking about bugs like other facilities are thinking about bugs. Um, yeah, because I feel like I once the soil system is dialed in, that's what allows the whole team, as long as, again, that QB has got his team ready to go. Now you're scoping. Now you're, you know, you're having brief meetings where you're talking about rooms and just finding ways to continue to improve stuff. Week goes by, months go by, then eventually years go by. And the whole system is dialed into where you can continue to improve, talk more about genetics, start to experiment a little more with those genetics and really make a brand for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and it, it takes time. I think, I just don't think under people, people understand how much time it takes and how long the grind takes. You know, you can listen to a lot of motivational speakers out there and, you know, Gary V is a great one. You know, it's just like, you know, you're, you've grinded for a year or two and you're complaining and you failed a couple of times. Well, it's like, man, you're just in preschool right now. You, you, you haven't even made it to middle school or high school or to university to be that expert to to you know go through that succession so you know I, I think people have to understand how long that grind takes and use whatever tools necessary you got to do to make it through that grind and I, I think people just need to be made aware of what tools are there and how they could be best using them um you know if you call me and say you've got problems and i'm given the opportunity to say you're here in sacramento i can come out and visit you you know in my tool bag is going to be a ph meter that does EC, uh, PPMs, uh, water temperature. Uh, I'm going to have my EC uh, probe so I can stick it into the soil or any of your medias and see the EC and the temperature of what's going on. Um, you know, I'm going to look at your water quality. It's probably going to be the very first thing I look at is what is your water quality? What's the, the you know, bicarbonate level? Um, you know, like on my personal farm, uh, we've got water that's uh, below 47 PPMs. Uh, like right now it's the winter. So if I pull the test, it'll probably be around 22 ppms because the water aquifers are so, so full in the, the deepest parts of the summer. We're seeing higher from 47 to about 60 ppms. Um, anytime your water is below 47 ppms, it's actually considered artesian well water. So, you know, for me, at sometimes the year I've got artesian well water, which is the most amazing thing ever if you want to build a foliar spray. Um, you know, which is something we should talk about too, is building a foliar spray and stacking nutrients within that foliar spray, um, brings me to the best YouTube video I've ever looked, watched in my life, um, uh, from advanced eco agriculture and John Kemp, uh, and the plant health pyramid. So, you know, for these people that really geek out on this stuff, you know, you got to go into John Kemp's and advanced eco agriculture into YouTube and, and check out the plant health pyramid and and see you know what little pieces nuggets of information you take out of that and move forward with because you know some of those those basic things changed my life and how the way that i look at plants and and the way that i trust soil and you know i think 
people have to be able to trust soil in a certain sense. Um, so on the screen here, we've got the plant health pyramid, which explains the photosynthesis process. So at the bottom, uh, excuse me, at, at the top, um, we're not photosynthesizing very much and not creating sugars or fats or lipids. When we start photosynthesizing, then we're creating fats and lipids. Uh, then we can finally comp uh, create complete proteins. Once we have complete proteins, we can have complete photosynthesis and have efficiency of plant growth. So um, I'm definitely not educated anywhere nearly enough to be talking on the positive points of, of this and, and how to move your plant successfully through photosynthesis. But this joint got me onto this whole path a couple of years ago of bricks and how like, yo man, if we got super high bricks in our plants, we're gonna have pest resistant plants and all this stuff. And, you know, I was looking at it in a very closed minded frame and not seeing the whole picture of, you know, what was really there. And luckily we have people like Matt Gates, uh, who's been on this show to really see, you know, I wasn't really viewing the whole picture. I was just getting a little snapshot of kind of what's going on and not seeing everything that was there. Cause it's not just sugars in the plant that help the, the plant be resistant to bugs. There's a lot of other things. Uh, that go into building a healthy plant uh, to create something that is, you know, pest resistant, mold, mildew resistant. Um, I feel all strains can get that, get there. You know, there's a lot of breeders, a lot of people that say, you know, oh, you got to go with this. It's the best mold resistant. It's got the best genetics. It's, it's great. You know, I, I really think every plant strain can get to that if it's been put in the right environment. And it can't be put in that right environment unless we go through soil succession with that plant and processes is of amending that soil and seeing how that exact cannabis plant remediates heavy metals from that soil. And what's that point to where that plant has depleted that soil and it needs to be amended or added to so that plant can be in that thriving zone, that, that happy band of, you know, I've got enough nutrients where I'm going to take what I want whenever I want. Um, you know, that's like that Goldilocks kind of zone. And that little zone really is the the secret to success, right? And especially in a living soil system, the rhizosphere, that's that Goldilocks. And as long as like more what you were kind of getting to, uh, you manage that system, stop trying to to basically push that system on the plant and just kind of let let time start to take over. You know, I personally feel like really focusing on the, the microbial life on a whole nother level of um, thinking long term. And I feel like for, except for some of the people that you've mentioned today on the program, uh, there's very few commercial farmers that are thinking sometimes two, three, five years ahead uh, because of all the stresses of just being able to put things together. But it does seem like with the more of the living soil crowd, yes, you still have a lot of those problems, but it seems like there's more free time that starts to, to add up for the team. And they are just able to continue to put more time and effort into making sure that the protection is there as well. Not only just farming the plant, but finding ways to protect it, finding issues, little pockets uh, and putting those uh, small little fires out to just continue to grow healthy cannabis flip after flip. Like you're saying, 27 cycles. I mean, that seemed like a fairy tale a few years ago. Yeah, it really did. And I think a, a big problem people have is as you build up your knowledge in, in certain things, you know, there's so many times in my career, my growing, growing career where I was hanging my hat on, I discovered this new foliar spray that was going to be beneficial and it was going to wipe out all of my bug problems and mold problems. And, and I was hanging my hat on that for this year. That was going to be the successful thing that got me through this. Or maybe it was composting that I would be adding into my process that it was going to you know, carry me through this and bring me through it. And it was that interesting thing that I just was so excited to do in, in cultivation. I remember one year it was uh, IPM. Uh, I was all about beneficial bugs and I'm going to get on this program and be putting beneficial bugs into my system every year. And, and now it's like, I, I don't do that. You know, it's like now I've got so many, I bought, you know, so many praying mantis eggs and I bought so many, um, you know, uh, uh, the little red beetle guys, ladybugs and all these other little things that, you know, now they're natural in my area and they actually were already natural in my area in a certain sense. And I'm just kind of, uh, focusing in on them and allowing them to thrive and understanding, you know, where they are and how they work in my system. So 
you know, I, I think everybody has to go through that process of kind of like, you know, confusion and, and clarity of how things happen and why things happen and, and how to be successful through them. Um, you really got to have systems like this that people tell you what's not working. You know, I know there's probably a few people today that just put their lives on a compost tea that they brew for 24 hours and they, they focus their whole life, you know, around this compost tea for 24 hours. And then something happens with the irrigation system breaks and you can't disperse that, that, that compost tea. And you've either got to start over or feed something to your system that you are sacrificing that you know is not perfect. You know, so I, I hope there's people on this show that are just like, okay, well, screw that. I'm just going to do a quick extract and maybe I'll get the same results and maybe I'll spend 20 minutes doing that quick extract and I'll spend maybe the same amount of time cleaning the buckets, cleaning everything with a little bit of OxyClean and make sure it's ready to go for the next run compared to doing a three, four hour feeding process and cleaning and resetting everything and mopping up the floor, like, you know, really chasing it back to labor efficiency and, and what's efficient for a grower. Um, like this last year was the first year I never de-leafed um, in my outdoor greenhouse. Um, you know, just trying to see how de-leafing, you know, is that worth it? Is it not worth it? And this year I'm glad I didn't de-leaf and cut all the bottoms up because, you know, I, I definitely got a lot more product from that, even though it wasn't maybe full or larfy, you know, I'm going for solventless rosin a lot of time for my personal product. So it's like, Hey, it's just more going in the washer. So. Yeah. Well explain. Oh, I thought Peter yeah. was about to say something. No, I just figured Tyler would appreciate not being left on full screen by himself when he stopped talking. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Oh shit. He stopped talking. Uh, now it, it's in, you know, some of the stuff we've talked about, like I just pulled up, um, hold on. Let me cue it up. So th this is, I mean, I don't know, 208 weeks ago, however many years ago that was, but this is all cocoa. So like th this was up in Topanga and those plants look very sad right now, but they pop back up later. But th this is when we first put, uh, uh, the clones in there. Um, and we had, there was a, a covered stru I mean, not, it was a bunch of lumber <laughs> with shade cloth on it, but I had like a hundred plants where I'm standing. And then this was me like, ex I'm like, why don't I just expand out this way? And, um, but I was doing everything in cocoa and we would have, we, we made our own powdered, uh, a and B and then, on, th this was a remote place where I could only really get to, you know, twice a week maybe. So I had, uh, you know, the to I had a I scaled up to two totes so that I, <laughs> my nutrients would last me even longer. Um, but this was my, you know, beginning LA kind of grow. Uh, in so my first experience with grassroots was with cocoa and hydro. Um, and just as we were talking about this stuff, it was interesting for me to just think about kind of like where I've gone and where I've been, um, and where people are still at. I mean, if you look here in Sacramento, there's Lumpy's flower, they're growing in four by eight raised beds on indoor rolling benches with straight cocoa core. They use the, that cocoa core three times, and then they've got too high of EC or pH levels and they reset and they start new. Um, they do really interesting stuff. They even cook their rooms in between the cycles because it's a synthetic grow. So they turn their lights up a hundred percent and they turn their heaters up all the way and they cook everything in the room to kill everything. Um, so, I mean, there's still people that are using these raised beds with just straight cocoa core and doing feeding and nutrient programs for indoor cultivation, just because they feel that that's what works best for them. And then this is the exact same time. This is down or up in Carpinteria with John, uh, where we were testing out the, uh, you had sent some four by eights and, uh, and remember the, the, the first 62 by three ones, like the, the first so that, longest bed we've ever did. Yeah. yeah. So, so that, that was us with Scott and John and, uh, and Matt Jergy, and uh, it was such an awesome team there. But anyway, th this is soil, um, but like all the all the plants there, uh, 
they would root out in in cocoa um and then we were testing this stuff too but it, like th this was for me i'm just thinking like this was my beginnings of playing around with kind of grassroots and raised beds and so i had like cocoa up in topanga we had you know the soil down or up in carpinteria um and the only reason i'm showing this is just to, like as we're talking and, and you're talking about like you know, to, to, for a commercial operation to scale up to that much soil is, uh, you know, if you're, even for me at home, like every, anytime I have to fill a new raised bed, I'm just like, fuck, <laughs> like I gotta, I gotta get a lot of volume in there. Yeah. So it's crazy to think you'd only use that a couple of times and, and have to swap that stuff out and get rid of it. Um, and it's just really awesome that there's people like Steve out there, like Steve Cantwell. I mean, I've talked to him one time and, you know, he's like, I'm passing this system, this facility on to my children. Like my children are going to understand yeah. they're treating it like an old Italian restaurant. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like the next generations are going to be hitting this and doing it the same way. And we're going to be figuring something out new and, and moving forward with it. So <laughs> this was, this was the, the Prius was the clown car. This was uh, trying to get as many bags of cocoa in it as possible. Well, you got a P Prius there, Peter. <laughs> Because it gets good gas mileage. I can go far once from one, state one, to state. One, once it's loaded up with that cocoa, it can travel great distances. Amen to that. Cocoa or cannabis, it can travel great distances. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> That's the modern uh, horse right there. Horse with good gas mileage. Yep. Well, uh, so any we other are... questions you guys got for me here? Anything else that we didn't touch on you guys are thinking we need to? I was kind of going to open it up to the audience. So we like to kind of leave the last 10, 15 minutes to the audience, see if they have anything. And then, yeah, we can kind of wrap it up. Well, actually, you touched on it. So just getting back to personal stuff, uh, you, you're you mostly smoking hash these days or rosin? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's my main cultivation thing that I'm doing is to grow um, – Something with cake in it because I've had the best uh, yields with, you know, some of the cake stuff there. Um, you know, yields great for flour as in consumption for like my parents. Uh, or, you know, obviously if I'm going to turn everything else into hash rosin, rosin uh, it's always going to be something with cake in it. Um, and then also something with some really good flavor, like some orange cookies or something that get cl gets close to that tangy. It's not going to yield great in any of the extracts that we do. But it's, you know, something really great to add into things or to do flavor mixes. Um, uh, this last year, I did some good flavor mixes to where um, when I went to actually press the rosin, I had, you know, obviously my dried powders that came out of my freeze dryer. And I decided to do a little 40-60 mix in between some orange cookies and some ice cream cake. And it created a flavor that I've just never seen before. And I, I smoked that whole jar until it was completely gone. And I didn't even get a chance to share anybody with it. It was so damn good. I was just every little piece gonna, of it. It was amazing. Did, did, you, did you go to the Ego Clash? No, no, I, yeah. I haven't been invited to the Ego Clash. You actually have to be invited to that. Um, but no, I haven't been out there doing that. Um, but uh, on, my, on my personal Instagram, I've shared some of my uh, hash rosin with uh, straight organics. And uh, I gave him a couple of uh, jars of my uh, hash a year or two ago, and he posted about that. And that was kind of like my biggest accolade ever had was uh, uh, Straight Organics, an amazing guy, very humble man, was just like, oh, my God, like, this is amazing. Some of the best flavor I've ever tried for ice cream cake. And I about crapped myself when he posted that for me. You're talking about <laughs> the dude in Oregon? Is that who you're talking about? Uh, no, straight organics. No, he, he's uh, in California. So. I, I actually talked to him a long time ago about coming. Maybe I'll, you reminded me to follow up with him. Yeah, he like he he's been documenting his like beginnings of commercial grow and like the triumphs and like the team and let me pull up his Instagram. He's Maybe a big a... proponent of CBD CBD capsules. Um, right on. But yeah. Seth is an awesome dude. Um, he was working with uh, Cali Kosher back in the day down in Modesto. We did some cool uh, raised beds. They were some of the first people to do some of our raised beds. Um, that's his mother there. Um, she had passed away, passed away a while ago. She was a really sweet lady. I got the chance of uh, hanging out with him on his farm and meeting her. 
Um, <laughs> some of the funniest memes, oh, especially the, the uh... wow. And what yeah, county beautiful. is he in? Uh, he's actually got a grow he's working on up in Mendocino. Mendocino um, okay. I, yep. And then uh, is is that where he in... started? I, I thought he started somewhere else, but I may just be. Totally oh yeah, wrong. he started uh, down in I would say uh, in the two hundred nine. That's about as, as as close as I'm going to be able to say because I'm a 209 local too, and if I was him, I wouldn't want my exact town blasted out or anything like that. But if you know the the counties in California, he's in the 209, um, and uh, really awesome dude. It was great to see him go through a, a very inspiring process he went through of of building his own body up and becoming healthier. You can see right there. He went from, you know, being kind of overweight to, to really focusing in on his body and his health, uh, which is a, a process that I'm getting through in my life right now and, and being a lot healthier and trying to make sure I make it to an old age and can still have fun in the bedroom and all that good stuff. <laughs> I, I, you don't I, want to be I, I, popping I, them pills, popping them funny looking pills, man. You want to be able to you mean that. You gotta through, stay bud. Go stay young. Is the girlfriend watching right now? No, definitely not. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, so that's got uh, some interesting. I feel stuff like a lot of there. farmers, uh, when they do start to really get into living soil, see the the correlation between plant health and just gut health. Uh, we kind of yeah. mentioned this yesterday on the show, even with Duke. I think just the the overall process starts to make sense. Um, whether it hits you in the head, you know, the first couple of months or it takes a year or two, you should really start to see that like, wow, like if I really focus on the microbial health of either one of these things, um, th the fruition comes about um, relatively quick from uh, like a health stand, uh, standpoint. Yeah, plus if you can put your cannabis plants and your vegetables on the same feeding schedule, doing the same stuff. Um, you know, and, and create food that actually, you know, comes out to be medicine because it's so high quality and so minerally charged. I mean, I, I think there's it's just endless benefits to, you know, the compounding factors of you being able to walk out and put your own, you know, feet in your soil and pull some tomatoes and green beans out and put it in your own salad every day. It's just, you know, makes you really happy too. Yeah, real nutrients. Uh, Peter, do we have some questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, let me just find, because he asked a two-part question. Uh, this is loyalty. Where is the part one? Hard for me to find three-by-three three trays. What suggestions are there for alternative solutions to make or use a tray? And then part two of his question was, anyone else use PVC end caps on the pipe to prevent the chance of the fabric from uh, ripping? Uh, we, in our instructions, we actually suggest to use a file that you can file down the ends of the PVC pipe or cut it in a manner where it, it doesn't hurt the bottoms of the fabric bed. Um, and in a certain sense, you should be putting this thing together once, filling it with soil once and putting it in its final resting place. So there shouldn't be much stretch, stress actually done to the fabric or, or wear in that certain case. Um, you know, we haven't seen many issues there. Um, but you know, if you wanted to take some extra precaution, it would definitely be good to put some extra, you know, end caps on the bottoms of those, of those legs that would definitely help. Um, I've also had people even put reducers in the top of the trellis pieces to reduce them down to three quarter inch and put a metal pole, uh, down through the center of that, uh, trellis system. So you're hanging your trellis off of a metal pole instead of PVC pipes, um, which is getting pretty common. And what was his two-part question? I think I missed part of it. I think I lost the other part. Uh, it, oh, three by three trays. I don't know if he's talking about like the plastic trays to lay under something, but uh, that was my assumption. Yeah, the plastic. I mean, really, if somebody calls me and they're trying to find a plastic tray, I'm going to try to find where they're at, you know, because we want to find the closest place to them because, you know, shipping or freight of that tray is ridiculously expensive. You want to be able to go and try to pick it up from a local place if you can possibly. Um, but if you go for a plastic tray, I'm going to tell you, you know, the most biggest brand out there you're probably going to find is like Botanicare. 
They have a, a low tide tray that has like 90 degree angle sides compared to some of the trays that kind of V out and get wider as they go up for flood and drain systems. Um, but just a basic botanic air tray, the three by threes are pretty common. Um, if you don't want to use a plastic tray, that's awesome. I would use a plastic pallet. I would not use anything wood. Um, we've had several people use these really cool uh, snap together 12 inch by 12 inch plastic tiles. Uh, where it's like a 12 inch tile with drainage holes in it for like a pool area or a kitchen or even a garage. They do, you know, full on garages with the plastic decking. And I've had people that uh, set that decking down and set the, the pots or beds right on top of it and allow some airflow through the bottom. Um, you know, in a, in a four by four tent, I would put a three by three bed. So you have extra airflow and movement in a five by five tent. I would put a four by four bed. Um, you know, and taking in mind that the canopy of the plant is going to get much larger than the actual bed. And, and that's why we, we size those situations correctly for those tents. Um, and I've got uh, a Zoom meeting at about 110. So I've got just a few more minutes left here, guys. We got yeah, eight, there's no more questions. Eight minutes. Can, uh, uh, I'm just asking for a clarification. Uh, Appreciate your time, Tyler. I know you're a busy guy. Appreciate it. I don't know if Appreciate you can describe you what kind of, quote, canvas or screen is he using in the pots. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, they're probably talking about the liner, the white liner inside of there. Um, oh. It's actually made from... The Go moisture lock, um, right? Yeah, the moisture lock barrier is made from the same material as the tan fabric. It just has a different manufacturing process, and it starts out as a white material. Um, and it's made so there's no air breathability to it. Um, I mean, pretty right much just, just a you. plastic tarp. It's right yeah. behind you. If you got right behind you there. Um, got my camera on the other side here. So that white liner there is... Um, it's weird because the camera's on this side, but uh, that white liner is just a basic uh, tarp material uh, that's American made that we stitch into it uh, to prevent the uh, air pruning from happening in that zone. Um, we want the water to, like it shows right there, just to go down and out the bottom. So, so it's it makes uh, a big difference with uh, when I was using your, your uh, larger ones, your 100 gallons for worm farming. Uh, when they would have babies, clusters of babies, there's all these little white ones that are like, almost like I used, to, for lack of a better term, it was almost like a pre-worm. And there's sometimes hundreds of them. It seems like they kind of, some die off, but some thrive. Uh, but in a cheap fabric pot, you would see them all over the uh, the uh, tray. Uh, where we're with yours for whatever, you know, moisture lock. And I think with just keeping the balance, um, I, you don't see that with your product. Yeah, the, the worms are held within it, and that's, that goes down to the manufacturing process of our fabric because, it's like I said before, it's heat set on both sides. It's got two hard sides, um, and it's a lot harder for uh, those, you know, larvae, worm larvae, the really small worms to pass through there, um, where it's very common for those porous materials for it to pass through, and all of a sudden you've got this worm population that dies on the outside of your container. It's pretty sad. Um but very common with well, like, cheaper materials from overseas. You guys were joking about like, how do we speed the process up? I mean, that's one of the easiest ways is to really start to get the, the worm populations up. So if you're really trying to get that going and they're all actually crawling out the fabric pots, uh, dying on the outside, uh, then again, that's just a slower process to try to get the wheels churning. So these are just little things that I feel like the newer farmer can see P putting in a, a few extra dollars uh, to, you know, to have a quality, uh, frame basically you know your product is based for lack of a better term and for me is like a frame uh, and then you need to be able to with your brain build that soil system with however you want to do that uh, but that's you know that's kind of where where that's on you but having a quality built system uh, starts with you yourself researching the brands that are going to last because the style has to last uh, otherwise it is extremely ex expensive if you had to, to flip things over like you had mentioned every three times uh, that's ex I can't imagine the labor, how labor intensive that would be constantly. Um, so there goes a lot of those profits that you're talking about. You know, a lot of companies don't think about that at first. All right. So this will be yeah, the last definitely. one uh, just because it's 106. So Cheddar Bob 
clarified that uh, are are you guys think that, I guess he wants a, uh, a a fabric sip setup. So sub irrigation. Huh. Would that be? I would uh, say I I did a whole podcast with um, Stephen um, that does. Uh, Gosh, what is his name? Aquaponics. Um, potent ponics. Uh, yeah. Potent ponics. Yes. So potent ponics. Um, I've had you know over the years a lot of people contacted us with SIP systems. Um, I'm yet to see a SIP system actually work for the long term. Uh, most of the time, we see uh, water molds pop up and cause failures. Um, you know, obviously in the system, molds in the soil create molds on the plant. So, you know, um, talking with uh, Stephen from Potent Ponics, you know, the only design that we feel would work would be a design that can be fully drained and refilled as far as your water aquifer below the plants. Um, you know, if that water is sitting there for long periods of time without oxygen, it's gone anaerobic and you're going to get water molds that pop up. Um, you can add in a bunch of beneficials and you could add in all this kind of crazy stuff, but it still happens and you have you know, really dark, dank areas that are highly moisturized and they're going to get nasty. So, you know, um, I've got a whole podcast I did on the Grassroots Living Soil podcast with Steven from Potent Ponics, and we kind of break down the different designs that he has seen successful just because I've seen so many failures. So I don't recommend it. I, I recommend doing a full pot or bed, just as much soil, fluffy, beautiful soil as you can, nice mulch layer on the top and, you know, allowing soil succession to take time and just knowing that it takes time to get to the end goal. It's going to take, you know, three to five years for this soil really to be popping and doing the right things for you. All right. And we can end it on that one so that you don't get chastised by the people waiting for you on that zoom meeting. Perfect. Thank you guys. I really appreciate you guys having me on here and I love my job helping people out in grassroots and my, the main part of my job is when you call in here and you got a question about our products or question about growing, you get to talk to me. So your success is my success. I mean that for anybody I talk to on any level. So uh, any way I can help you guys be successful, I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give it to you straight. It might be a hard pill to swallow, but, you know, hey, we're here to get through it together. Just don't make them angry. I'm a nice guy. Come on now. I'm a Pisces. I'm easy. I'm joking. I don't think I've ever seen you angry. I was going to say. <laughs> so with that, uh, you got some love from the New Englanders. Thank you, guys. Salute. From the, uh, the desert people. And uh, with that, we will... Oh, so sorry. Uh... I don't know if anything's going on in the afternoon, but I at least know that tonight, uh, Hotza Herbs Grow and Tell, I have no idea what this week's topic is, but I will uh, know in the next. I believe it's uh, cleaning. Yes, that's right, because he made the graphic this week, which means I am no longer responsible for the graphics, which makes me very happy. <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, 6 o'clock Pacific time, 9 o'clock. For the New Englanders. And with that, Tyler, we appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we appreciate it, buddy. we'll see you again soon. Thank you, guys. You guys have a good one.